Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this Géant Info Share dedicated to management and monitoring of time and frequency services. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, please note that uh, this uh, Info Share will be uh, recorded. Uh, oops. Just uh, one slide to, to show you that there was a previous uh, dissemination works and you can find on this uh, on this slide, the uh, white paper, quite interesting, and also some other, other info shares that we did previously. Uh, so, uh, this info share was organized by uh, Optical Time uh, and Frequency Network uh, team from uh, GN4-3 in the web package uh, WP6. And you have here the email list where you, uh, you, know, you can contact us if you have any questions. Regarding uh, this uh, info share, you, I think you are uh, now uh, familiar with the, how we proceed. So if you have any question, please use the, the chat. In uh, all the presentation, uh, have five minutes at the end to, to ask some questions. So you would be able to, to ask uh, uh, any, any important things that you, that you would like to, to, uh, to, to highlight. There will be uh, uh, two uh, sessions. The first one will focusing on uh, monitoring and management on different uh, time and frequency uh, technology, optical carrier, time and radio frequency technology. And this uh, session will be chaired by Dr. Joseph Pochek from, uh, from, uh, from CESNET. And the second session will focus on White Rabbit and will be chaired by uh, Dr. Suzanne Nagel Jackson from Friedrich, Friedrich Alexander Universität Erlangen Nür Nürnberg. So, uh, Joseph, the floor is yours. Xavier, thank you. Thank you very much for introduction of the uh, whole session. And uh, first talk of this session is optical career optical frequency carrier transfer and will be given by Nicolas. Uh, he's now with Renater and uh, please let me briefly introduce the Nicolas. Uh, he has been working from uh, 2013 to 17 on the uh, French National RFMF Plus project uh, that uh, aims to build a, a national TF network. In 2017, Nicolas joined Renater to uh, utilize the skills in the time and frequency domain and took part in the uh, uh, TF national and international partnerships like projects T, RefIMF, CloneNets, CloneNets DF, uh, and the uh, GN4 free activity OTFN which we are uh, now today on this activity in for share as a member of um, the wdm team he is also in charge uh, with designing of renater optical network architecture nicolas please floor is yours and please uh, have in mind that uh, uh, you have 25 minutes as xavier mentioned we are short on time Thank you very much uh, for this introduction, Joseph. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, thank you all for joining this uh, info share today. Um, okay. So can you all see my screen? Yes, uh, oh, perfect. There's some background noise. Okay, uh, perfect. So um, in this first topic, I'd like to, to discuss about the optical carrier transfer frequencies that we are using in France. Uh, so as uh, Joseph has mentioned, we um, the um, time and frequency metrological network in France is called the um, REFIMEF. And uh, in this presentation, I'm going to discuss a little bit about the Renater Optical Network. Uh, I'm sure that you've seen it uh, many times, but well, just a, a, a short refresh. Uh, after that, we'll discuss about the reform of time and frequency yeah. infrastructure in France, uh, the IP connectivity, uh, which will be our main topic here. Uh, IP connectivity in inline amplifier sites, uh, which is quite difficult uh, to, to set up. 
supervision and monitoring of time and frequency equipments. Uh, and I mean how supervision and, mon and monitoring is integrated in day-to-day -day routines of, uh, of NREN day-to-day um, -day life. Uh, and uh, last part will be about the maintenance in, maintain in operational condition and day-to-day -day routines. Uh, so let's start with Renata Optical Network. Uh, um, I'm sure, well, you, you've seen this picture a lot of times before, um, but well, just a short refresh. Our mm -hmm. photonic layer is mainly uh, based on infinite equipment, uh, current equipment, uh, to transmit, amplify, and receive information. Mm -hmm. um, on the right side, you can see that uh, the Renata footprint is quite wide. We have 12,000 mm -hmm. kilometers of dark fibers. Uh, our fibers are mainly based on um, G652 fibers, uh, which makes Renater the fourth in European NREN with the largest uh, fiber footprint. Um, what's um, something, well, um, some information about our photonic layer. Uh, in our network, we are using some contra element pumps, uh, which is um, well, something that is important when you have uh, bidirectional signals in your network. Uh, we have fixed uh, ODM and uh, we have a coherent network uh, based on uh, QPSK and QAM modulations. And we are using up to 16 QAM modulations. Um, okay. Uh, just a short, uh, well, one picture is about the, the different elements the, that we are using in our network. So as I was saying, we here I just um, I'm just showing some infinite equipment. We have we are now using the uh, HIT um, 73100 uh, SRS3. Uh, oh, maybe I'm just gonna change. Can you see my mouth or? Okay, whoop, sorry. Yes, uh, so, okay, so at the top here is the, the um, HIT 7300 um, that can host Raman pumps as well. Uh, we, as I was saying, we have mixed non um, the mixed filters, uh, and we can use up to 40 channels in the C bands. Uh, and, um, Main equipment uh, in front that we are using is the MTA that you may know. Uh, it's a, um, it can use client service interfaces up to 100 uh, giga Ethernet and uh, can be used as cross connection, uh, OTN, and uh, switch fabric, packet switching, and so on. <clears throat> Uh, and what about the RefMF time and frequency infrastructure in France? Uh, so currently in France, we have the two projects, the RefMF Plus, which started in uh, 2012 and ended in 2000, and will end, sorry, in 2024. And parallelly, we started the T-RefMF um, uh, the year before uh, to extend the time and frequency footprint that we're going to have in, in France. So some key information about the time and frequency service that we are uh, distributing in our network. So as I was saying, and it's uh, important that we uh, are distributing a bidirectional propagation, uh, bidirectional signals that needs uh, to, to propagate in both direction in the fibers. Um, our time and frequency service is in the middle of the C-band. So it's uh, using the uh, 1542.40 nanometers. And uh, well, some info about that, the fact that we make sure that um, because we are we have some Raman pumps in our networks, uh, we make sure that the output power of our time and frequency devices are always below three dBMs um, to avoid some misinteraction with uh, Raman pumps that would amplify the signal and create some uh, some SBS effects, similar to the Brillouin scattering effects, and so on. Uh, and in this project, we have the chance in France to have a huge collaboration with many uh, academic laboratories. So with, oh, uh, in, in our FMA project, so we have 17 uh, labs and we now have uh, 24 academic laboratories in the next uh, tier FMA project. And you can see here on the map on the right side that um, the the, the different laboratories uh, map match pretty pretty well um, how the the Renata network um, is uh, 
or is based um, because well mainly the laboratories are hosted in in the universities uh, which are uh, connected in the reformer in the renata network sorry and so far as you can see on the right side we have um uh, the develop deploy sorry some the reformer signal uh, in two thirds of the reformer um, targeted uh, footprint, uh, there's still some some part of the network that needs to be installed. Um, some feedbacks about so from now on we we have installed uh, more than three thousand kilometers of fibers. Uh, we have been using the time and frequency this time and frequency service for twelve years and without any impacts. Uh, we even distribute this signal without any guard bands, and uh, the main information that Renata. Uh, EPA and users have never been impacted by terminal frequency services. And last information about the infrastructure in France, REFIMEF has become in uh, 2021 the uh, national research infrastructures, and uh, this will be part. Well, this will be the French the French contribution to the time and frequency European research infrastructures. Okay, <clears throat> so um, here is a typical uh, time and frequency link in France. Uh, it is based on uh, RLS repeater station, which are uh, deployed in extremity sites. Uh, we also have directional amplifiers that are installed in uh, inline amplifier sites. So yeah, in this picture, um, I created a three a link with three inline amplifier sites. And uh, the question is um, how those equipment are uh, integrated in Renata network. So. Uh, in our extremity sites, and you can see on the left side, we have uh, the repeater stations, and on the right side, you can see that we have the UADMs that are used to insert and uh, extract the the metrological signal that can't go through our mono our our unidirectional amplifiers, telco amplifiers, uh, and here is the bidirectional time and frequency amplifiers here. Um, some information about the RLS, um, and we those are also well-known information. I'd like to um, point out the the IP parameters. Uh, I mean those uh, repeater station. They have um, hundred, uh, ten, hundred, or thousand base T ports, uh, and the protocols that are that can be used to communicate with the repeater station are SNMPv3 and uh, SSH. And are manufactured by the IX Blue company. Uh, same thing for the reduction amplifiers and the ODMs. Um, the ODM is a passive equipment, so there is no connectivity ports, and we do not want to 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 connect to to it. Uh, but for amplifiers here, um, one should notice that we only have 10 and 100 base T ports, and uh, SNMPv2 on SSH. Um, why did I say important is that uh, sometimes in our routers, you can have a thousand base T ports and you need to be sure that uh, it matches the these constraints with the amplifiers to to be able to connect uh, and, uh, and send uh, some IP packets to it. Okay, so how do you bring IP connectivity in point of presence and uh, inline amplifier sites? Um, in fact, it's quite easy uh, when you are in extremity sites because you uh, are directly connecting the um, your time and frequency equipment uh, to your routers that you have in, in your sites. Uh, but it's way harder to have to bring connectivity in uh, the time and frequency bidirectional amplifiers that are hosted in inline amplifier sites. Um, why that? Um, it's, well, um, if we want to have, well, we, we all know that the USC um, is used to to get information and to monitor or supervise the, the telco um, equipment that we installed in fields. Uh, but because we are forced to extract and insert our time and frequency service uh, before the, the, the telco Unidir amplifiers, uh, you can see that the USC is not going through the time and frequency amplifiers. So we have to find a countermeasure to bring connectivity in those sites. 
Uh, our first idea in France was uh, to use some GSM cards onto the GSM network. Um, we had some bidirectional amplifiers that were manufactured by the company uh, Idil uh, that were used on uh, well radio transmissions um, in order to to send some. Uh, comment to the amplifiers if you wanted to modify the gain or if you wanted to shut down the pumps and so on and to be honest it wasn't working well and we had to to find another alternative for that uh, so if you were thinking about that idea i wouldn't recommend it um, so our second approach was to discuss with uh, the optical vendors and uh, we were in fact at the at a key moment where Renate had to renew its optical layer. So when we were discussing with uh, Coriant, um, we asked them to provide us a solution to have some connectivity in, in those sites, in those uh, intermediary sites. And um, they came back to us uh, with a solution based on uh, some user ports uh, that are um, accessible in their controller cards in every amplifier site. Um, in fact, what you can um, build here um, is that you can insert a signal in an amplifier and extract it in the next one or um, in any other hopes that you that you want. And uh, what we uh, built in our RefMF network is that we have a point-to-point -point connectivity um, based on the, those two uh, user spots. Uh, where in location one we have we are we are sending uh, a first well we are creating our first bridge to location two and uh, we install here a switch and send some signal in user port two to the next site and so on and so on and so on and we are able to to have some connectivity uh, in those sites so we are not talking about a huge bandwidth as you can see the part of this um, of the bandwidth that is dedicated to these user channels, uh, connecting the different user ports, uh, is up to one megabyte per per second. So you won't be able to download the the, the last uh, Top Gun movie, uh, but it will be enough to uh, for you to to pass some information and to get some information uh, from from your time and frequency reduction amplifiers, and to monitor and supervise those equipment. Uh, so above is a picture of the, the Corian controller cards that we are using, and you can see that we uh, connected um, the, our amplifiers to, to the card. Um, so this is a, a scheme of uh, what we, we built. Uh, so in, in extremity sites, you, uh, you have to connect the, the first user port to your routers, uh, and then the um, Thanks to the to this user channel, you bring that you you are bringing connectivity in the the extremity user ports, uh, and uh, you connect this port to to your reduction amplifiers. And uh, well, it's not depicted here, but if you want to to go to the second inline amplifier sites, you connect to a switch and send some signals back to the user ports too, and and to build the point to point bridge. And that's it, in fact. Um, thanks to, to, to these setups, uh, you can extract some, some IP connectivity in your inline amplifier sites. And uh, well, you just have to configure your, your routers as a gateway uh, for those uh, time and frequency reduction amplifiers. Uh, but it's working very well. And uh, you were able to manage all the time and frequency equipment that you installed in your network. Uh, OK, but what for? Um, so we all know that uh, it's very important that any new element that are that is installed in a telco network has to uh, needs to comply with telco day-to-day -day, uh, work. Um, we have we need the ability to go to collect traps and uh, as a day-to-day -day supervision, uh, amplifiers can be uh, can the protocol as I was saying they can we can use SNMPv2 and SNMPv3. V3, sorry, for the repeater station. Uh, and we also have, um, we also need the ability to switch off the optical layer. Uh, we want to be sure that our network operating system um, and 
is able to be in a situation without any time and frequency services uh, to be able to troubleshoot what is happening in the optical layer. And so the, we, it was a key aspect for us that the NOC uh, needs to have control on any time and frequency equipment and to turn it off when possible, when, when required. Um, three actors are in fact connected to the different time and frequency elements uh, that are hosted in uh, L3 VPN uh, for the RIFMEV uh, project. Uh, and so we have our, uh, the network managing system, monitoring system uh, that is connected to, to, well, that is used um, by our NOC and uh, the core team of the RIFMEV project, uh, which will set up the meteorological signal and the IX Blue company, uh, which uh, developed and um, uh, at the control of the, well, uh, the maintenance of the time and frequency elements in that are installed in, in Renata network. And the second thing that uh, needs to be done and uh, well documented is the ticketing procedures. Uh, how the NOC is going to, to handle any uh, incident involving time and frequency equipment. Uh, so we developed three, uh, three different layers of supervision. First one is that our NOC uh, should be able to turn off uh, the different time and frequency elements, plus uh, some inventory, uh, classical inventory things, with the name, version, type, and temperatures of the, those equipments. Uh, IX Blue needs to, um, um, to monitor and control the FMF performances. Uh, first, a quick, uh, quick change that needs to be done. And the third layer is the meteorological team that are really uh, uh, well, fine tuning of the time and frequency uh, elements to have an appropriate time and frequency service sent to the end users. Um, about the maintenance in, oper in operational condition, here you can see two pictures of what our NOC is uh, actually seeing. Uh, so you have a map of the RIFMEV projects on where the different elements are installed uh, with some red dots when, when we have some alarms and so on. And on the right side, you can see that the, the main characteristics uh, that are uh, depicted and easily uh, uh, found on understandable for any um, engineers working in Renata's NOC. Uh, you can see that, for instance, on the right side here, we have the uh, laser diode state, um, which only, uh, which, well, which shows if there is some time and frequency signal that is injected into fibers or not. And the, if required, the engineer can just turn it off. Um, and about the time and frequency ticketing procedures. So um, how, is, how is it? Um, integrated in Renata network. Uh, in fact, when we have an incident in the network, uh, it generates a, a ticket, so a classical ticket. And the first thing that we, we want our engineers uh, to, to do is to find, well, of course, uh, to have a normal procedures on finding the, the root cause. And if they do not um, find the root cause and um, they we ask them to, um, to look if there is any RIFMEV equipment installed in the link. And if so, uh, they have the, the possibility to shut it down and we encourage them to do so um, in, in order to be in a situation where we don't have any time and frequency equipment uh, on. And uh, that will be um, uh, being back in a telco standard procedures uh, with uh, normal elements and they can proceed as for any uh, standard uh, incident. And of course, uh, when we uh, are turning down the time and frequency equipment, it generates a uh, time, time and frequency ticket opening. And uh, when the incident is closed, uh, we allow the, the RFMF core team to turn the equipment back on and to be back in an operational state. So that's how it works in, in Renater, and uh, this procedure has been um, validated uh, by two NOC that we had. Uh, to wrap up, um, what needs to be really uh, effective is how time and frequency um, is an operating network. Uh, it means that it has to be easily integrated in day-to-day -day routine, and it requires some inbound connectivity to be performance. 
Um, I would advise you to to really think about this, uh, and uh, because when we, we had some CNI equipment in our network, uh, we were forced to use the GSM solution, and it wasn't working at all. So, if you you can discuss with your optical vendor and try to find a solution, that would be the the best thing to do, um, and to see whether they can provide you some IP um, connectivity in the huts. Uh, key aspects, key aspects, sorry, about uh, monitoring and supervision. Uh, we believe that you need to have some responsibility layers for each actor. Uh, the NOC um, can turn the equipment down and only turn them down. They can never turn it on. Uh, that's the meteorological team's job. Uh, you need to have some monitored parameters for the NOC. You don't need uh, hundreds of them. You just need to, uh, for them to see whether there is some signals injected in the fibers or not. And uh, about the reformer of infrastructures, uh, I want to highlight that it's a safe environment uh, with 12 years of uh, backgrounds without any uh, incident on, on internet traffic. Uh, and that we, have, we are now working with private companies and different NOCs that understand, comply, and work uh, with NRN processes and constraints. So it's a really safe thing. It's doable, and we highly encourage you to do so. And uh, time and frequency can be integrated in, in the NREN supervision and monitoring tools uh, and in day to day procedures as well. So, if you have any questions, on. yep. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> please go ahead to ask for questions. Thank you very much for a very, very interesting talk. So, we are just on time. So, please, there are any questions? Yeah. I'm reading a question of in the chat. Uh, yep. in the chat. Uh, so yes, we've been working in uh, cross-border fibers. So we are connected in KL uh, with the German network. We are connected in Modern with uh, Lyft, the Italian network, or time and frequency network, sorry. And we are also working uh, on interconnection with uh, other countries. And I don't know if I'm allowed to, to speak about that. So, well, we, we are going to the CERN as well um switzerland and we yeah we're working on other cross-border fibers well spain and in northern countries as well okay thank you so please uh, and i think we are, you still can uh, ask uh, nicolas uh, directly you have uh, sure. email on the on the screen and now I would like to ask. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Christoph Kurza for his presentation. And before that, I would like to very briefly introduce Christoph. He, um, after, um, he's an employee of uh, Poznań Supercon. Supercomputer and Networking Center, which uh, is a national research and educational network in Poland. Uh, and there he deals with issues related to telecommunication trans transmission systems. And for uh, over 10 years, he has specialized in the time and frequency transfers in optical fiber networks. Uh, uh, in uh, PSNC, uh, Christoph is responsible for design and implementation of uh, these time and frequency transfer networks and maintenance of time and frequency repository. In the spectrum of his interest, he also conducts research of, on the effectiveness of time and frequency transfer in DWDM optical networks. Christoph, please, could you? share the screen and start the presentation. Perfect, I see it, it's yours. Thank you for your kind introduction. And, uh, uh, I will be uh, talking here about the, our experience in time and frequency transfer using the uh, base on the uh, LSTOP system, uh, which we uh, uh, developed in uh, our country and uh, and uh, put in our network. Uh, and ev it's everything about uh, management and moni co monitoring context. So uh, we concentrate here mostly 
on the aspects uh, with uh, management and monitoring. Nevertheless, I would like to, uh, at, uh, at the beginning, start uh, uh, with uh, to highlight to you uh, some difference uh, between time and frequency uh, distribution. So uh, every um, system which transmit uh, frequency uh, have to um, uh, have to have uh, sorry have to have a stable delay in in time. Uh, this delay is uh, crucial uh, because if uh, this delay is changing in the during the time, uh, this means that the frequency in the output system uh, will be uh, not stable, not accurate. It's, it's, and it wouldn't be uh, would it be exact copy of uh, uh, input reference frequency. Uh, when we talking about the time scale, this uh, delay of the system uh, have to be also constant, but also it have to be known. Uh, this is uh, very crucial uh, because uh, we don't want to have uh, some pulses of a seconds on the output, uh, but we would like to know the exact position of these pulses. Uh, in this context, we will be talking about the calibration of the time, absolute calibration of the time, which will be uh, later on the presentation. So, uh, as I mentioned, we're using LSTOP system, which is uh, developed by our colleagues from AGH University. Uh, this system uh, takes care about the uh, stabiliz stabilization of the uh, transmission uh, for the link. So, uh input signals uh, which is delivered uh, to this such equipment it's a uh, one pps signal is a time uh signal and 10 megahertz uh, uh, input which is uh, rf frequency uh which is delivered to the as an electric uh signals to the to, to these devices uh it's transmitted through the optical fiber network to the output and uh, at the end uh, on the remote side we have uh, two outputs uh, which is an uh, exact copy of uh, uh, input signals exact copy uh, is uh, if uh, this system working properly uh, and this system is designed for the uh, transmission in the single bidirection single big direction or transmission is single fiber or dark fiber but it's also uh, possible to implement it uh, in two fiber solution or uh, implement uh, this in the DWM system. Of course, uh, uh, it's uh, the, the basic system is uh, which we're using uh, dark fiber is uh, most accurate and most stable uh, solution. So uh, we decided in our network in PCNC, net, PCNC network to implement uh, this uh, uh, dark fiber solution. Uh, we connecting our National Measurement Institute uh, in Warsaw, uh, which is located in Warsaw with uh, other uh, UTCK lab, it's, which is located uh, in uh, very near our uh, office uh, in Borowiec. Uh, it's very near Poznan. Uh, from this UTCK lab, we transmit uh, the signal for the Pioneer network to the Torun, where are located the optical clocks, and to the also to VLBI station uh, near Torun. We have uh, also some implementation uh, in the DWDM system uh, from Poznan to Krakow on the south. And uh, from Warsaw, our National Measurement Institute uh, in Poznań to a uh, similar institution in Lithuania. Uh, this uh, is also uh, uh, implemented in the WTM network, but based on the desktop system. So, uh, in context of the areas of responsibility, as uh, you heard uh, before, uh, in Refimi network, they decided to split in this responsibility uh, to three partners. Uh, we decided to split it, this responsibility to two partners. 
It means UTXK labs uh, taking care about the sources of the, of the signals. So they generating the most accurate uh, signals. They delivering to us of devices. And next, uh, and everything what is next is uh, in responsible uh, uh, by PCNC. So we taking care about uh, uh, all optical network and uh, transmission for the uh, network to the end user. Even if it is uh, in the WDM network or not in the WDM network, we taking responsibility for a full time frequency uh, infrastructure, uh, which is located in our network. So UTK, UTCK lab, as I mentioned before, uh, are maintaining the time frequency reference clocks. Uh, they generate, they generating uh, reference signals, uh, one PPS and 10 megahertz uh, to the uh, S-top system. And they taking care about the absolute calibration. This is what I was mentioning at the beginning that such a calibration have to be done to, to, uh, uh, to have uh, good knowledge uh, about it, what uh, time is delivered to, to the end user. Um, so PCNC is uh, responsible for maintenance the for fiber optic network. Uh, we manage uh, all uh, L-stop devices. Uh, it means local remote uh, modules uh, plus uh, bidirectional DFAs. And uh, sometimes we supporting uh, uh, UTCK labs uh, for the uh, time calibration, especially uh, when um, the links are cascaded and uh, uh, because uh, this in the ASTOP devices, uh, this calibration is done in the local modules. So if we cascading such readings, uh, this local modules sometimes is uh, located in uh, our POPs. So in this uh, reasons, uh, we support um, UTSK labs in the making calibration. Um, so in context on the local modules, uh, we can uh, we have uh, very good knowledge of what is happened in the, um, the system. We know exactly uh, if uh, the signals is uh, electrical signals, uh, reference signals is uh, is getting to the our devices, uh, our it's mean as top devices. Um, but we haven't knowledge about the accuracy of such a signal. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, UTCK labs have to uh, produce uh, their signals uh, as, as good as possible. And uh, we have to believe that this is a good signals. Um, from the uh, line side, we can monitor opti received optical signal levels. So uh, we know if uh, the levels of the signals, optical signal is uh, enough or not. And uh, we have knowledge about uh, the full system status. Uh, it means uh, if the, uh, the stabilization of the full link is working or not. Uh, if uh, some other problems can uh, occur there or not. Um, this uh, three points, as you can see, uh, it's, uh, it's possible to monitor without any special metrology equipment, uh, which, is, uh, which are not available in our network. So, so um, this is, can be monitored just only by uh, our network operating center with any other additional devices. When we have uh, something like, uh, something what is named uh, time interval counter, it's, um, uh, it's a rather metrology uh, equipment, but very easy and uh, to, 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 to use it. We can monitor it, uh, moreover at the round trip type delay, uh, how it's changing. 
and we can help in the performing some calibration measurement uh, uh, for UTCK labs. Um, in context of uh, p-direction amplifiers, so we have uh, the full knowledge uh, about the input and output signals of the optical. Uh, we have knowledge about the amplifier gain, amplifier pump current, temperature module, and so on, so on. So uh, we have good knowledge uh, what is uh, optical signals, what is uh, this is uh, optical signals coming and how we uh, amplified and we can change uh, uh, this parameters i mean gain or pump current uh, this device is so so we can make uh, by us uh, it can be made by us um here i would like to highlight that also uh uh, this time frequency signals in RF domain, uh, which we're talking here, uh, can be multiplied with uh, optical carrier signals, uh, which is a, a transmission of a fre optical frequency in the single fiber and the single the in the same amplifier. So we can use the same uh, fiber for many kind of. Uh, 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 time frequency signals uh, and sending it bidirectional, bidirectional in the same fiber. So, so inter, uh, implementing new kind of uh, transmission of uh, metrology signals, uh, it's not uh, problematic for us. Um, the remote module, uh, the mon monitoring is uh, very simple. Uh, there is a receding uh, optical uh, uh, signal and uh, system status, which is also available on the uh, local model. Um, in context of the communication with this equipment, uh, we, has, we, we can access uh, via inbound or out of band uh, uh, channel uh, to such a, uh, equipment. Uh, in the latest uh, version of such equipment, we implemented an Ethernet connection between um, each of uh, these devices. So we have own uh, monitoring channel uh, inside the fiber. So uh, it's much easier to, to get to, to the uh, POPs where uh, there can be some uh, problems uh, with uh, out of band uh, connection to such equipment. Uh, communication is quite easy uh, through the SSH or um, uh, also in the last time we implemented web uh, access to the devices. Uh, we monitor for the SNMP versus version three of uh, two. Uh, we can generate the traps. So uh, this is all what we know from other DWDM equipment or other, other telco uh, devices and nothing new. Uh, so it could be, it should be uh, quite e easy to, in, to monitor through the uh, network operating centers, each uh, network operating centers. Uh, also to, we, we can provide access with different authorization levels. Uh, for example, with a user who have access just only to the monitor and to checking the parameters. Uh, and um, for users who are administrators and can uh, changing gains uh, on amplifiers uh, between uh, turning on, turning off uh, some uh, parameters or uh, operation modes. Uh, it's also possible uh, local radius user authentication. So, so uh, it looks that this system it's uh, very flexible uh, to implement uh, and uh, uh, friendly to use in the wide. Uh, uh, network infrastructure. Uh, here is an example of SNMP monitoring. Uh, 
which we can collect. And um, here about the uh, time calibration. Well, uh, when we're looking on the, this picture, it's maybe uh, the first view can be a little scary, uh, but this uh, time calibration, it's not so uh, difficult as it uh, can be looks in the first look. Uh, for the absolute calibration in the system, we just only have to have a time, in, a time interval counter, and we have to make a few, it's mean two measurement, uh, and uh, we have to just uh, put to the formulas uh, to, to have uh, good knowledge, to have uh, the full knowledge about the uh, um, absolute delay between uh, reference point, which is located in UTCK lab, and the output of our system. So we can uh, uh, precisely describe uh, what is the absolute delay between uh, source and end of uh, such a system. Uh, with accuracy to the couple of uh, uh, picoseconds. Um, so in the, 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 the newest L-stop system, uh, there is also uh, one additional block added, uh, which is named PPS advancing block. Uh, this is very helpful uh, because we can uh, move uh, uh, Process uh, which is generated on the output and uh, make that the input pulses and output pulses uh, are, will be at the same time on the time scale. Uh, it wouldn't be delayed, uh, delay uh, through the line, or uh, in other words, uh, the delay of the line will be cancelled in this uh, PPS advancing block. So uh, the user on the end of such a system just only plug in uh, to the system, to this black box, and uh, have exact copy of um, uh, signals which is generated in the uh, far away uh, 100 or 1,000 kilometers uh, lab. And, uh, I think it's uh, very, very useful. Uh, solution which is implemented in the last version of such a devices. Um, here we have some performance uh, examples uh, which uh, was published in many documents. So uh, output signals fluctuation is less than uh, uh, 30 picoseconds peak to peak. Uh, so, uh, so so um, the output signals uh, wouldn't be uh, um, would be have such a currency uh, comparing to the uh, input signals uh, when we're talking about the time and uh, when we're talking about the frequency we have uh, see some Allen deviation maybe. Uh, this uh, picture was more clear for the metrology, uh, metrology people than uh, networkers. Um, what will be new in the, our network in the future? Um, during the, the end of uh, next year, we would like to, uh, we have to uh, implement um, uh, distribution uh, network uh, distribution system of time on PPS and frequency 10 megahertz uh, uh, in pioneer network in almost uh, uh, all links uh, in our network. Uh, as you can see, all of these uh, red uh, links uh, will be have uh, a dedicated uh, uh, system transmit uh, in between main cities uh, in Poland. Uh, and the next uh, project which we realized at PCNC and also it have to be it has to be uh, finished uh, 
uh, in the 2023. Uh, it's a uh, optical carrier dissemination. Uh, we disseminating. We'll be disseminating uh, signals from uh, uh, Torun, where are located uh, Polish optical blocks, uh, to the uh, some partners in uh, in Poland. But also, we will be ready to uh, implement cross borders uh, connection with. Uh, other partners. So this is all uh, what I would like to, what I prepared uh, for you to, today. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Christoph, thank you. Thank you very much for your also very, ex uh, very interesting presentation. And please, are there any, any uh, questions? So if there are um, any questions, please, um, uh, did I get uh, correctly that uh, when uh, you are speaking about uh, DWDM transmission, is it transmission over shared fiber uh, with DWDM system or the transmission using uh, lambdas provided by DWDM system? Well, uh, when we're talking about uh, the implement at present implemented uh, solution in the PCNC uh, in the Pioneer, Pioneer network, it is a uh, shared lambda. Uh, it means the uh, transmission is unidirectional, just like uh, other. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Perfect. So it means that signal. it's uh, possible to use, let's say, in some with some let's say, limit, slightly limited performance, it's possible to use telecom lambdas, is it? Yes, uh, in the frequency, it's not problematic. Uh, in the time uh, distribution, it's uh, quite problematic. It means we can make the absolute calibration of the link uh, just only measuring, measuring uh, some uh, formulas and uh, uh, some uh, measuring some uh, making measurements uh, in the local module just only uh, but we have to use uh, some uh, other uh, system we, which uh, will allow us uh, comparing signals uh, in local and remote point so the, the, the sending time in the unidirectional systems uh, even if it will be two pair of fiber or um or uh, DWDM system it will be a little more complicated okay thank you very much so please are there any questions but if not you can still co uh, connect uh, contact sorry offline Christoph uh, on email shown or as Xavier sent to the chat uh, you can contact uh, OTFN contact group. So if we don't have any questions now, I would like to uh, ask uh, Fabian Mauchle from Switch to give his talk, remote management of optical frequency dissemination equipment in amplifier sites and labs. And uh, I would like also briefly uh, introduce uh, Fabian after finishing his master degree in information and communication technologies at the University of Applied Sciences, Rapersville. In 2010, uh, Fabian joined Switch as a network engineer. He started uh, with a focus on IP routing and slowly broadened his field uh, uh, towards network management of optical and DWDM systems. Fabian is still working on the job now since 12 years. So Fabian, please, could you start with presentation? Thank you. Thank you, Yosef. Uh, okay, so I will try to keep my talk fairly generic uh, without going too much detail of any specific vendor. Uh, and to set the stage, um, what I'm showing here is a, a schema of a DWDM system 
um, which you might find uh, at your own network if you bought your system like maybe five to seven years ago. Um, so for us, it was actually, we started the tender in about seven years ago and all the competition was more or less similar uh, in this uh, regard. Um, so basically you get your usually um, fiber pairs, uh, which transport your DW, you, um, your spectrum uh, amplified at each side. <clears throat> And you typically have some sort of wavelength switching, so roll them or some of the kind at uh, your major sites to add and drop signals. Uh, basically, all of those recent systems do include some kind of management network, which is usually IP based. So you get an IP network. Some call it DTN, some call it just OSC, it depends on the vendor. Um, what you usually have is integrated in, in, into your system, some kind of data network um, that is also present at amplifier sites. Uh, they usually use kind of a side channel, either 1510 nanometer or 1610 nanometer multiplexed on the same fiber, um, often transmitted at 100 megabit or gigabit, just normal SFPs. And what, as far as I have seen in, in, in our tender, basically every vendor nowadays offers is some kind of user port or inbound management port uh, that is connected to the management network, which allows, for example, uh, to attach power, monitor power supplies or uh, UPS battery systems, stuff you want to monitor at your intermediate sites. Uh, and these form a network. Uh, in our case, um, they actually talk plain OSPF uh, on this network. So it's very easy to integrate uh, in any uh, network you already have. If you, if you compare this to the frequency dissemination setup, which in some kind is also a TWDM or at least an optical system, uh, typically operating at a single channel uh, on a single fiber and as a speciality uses bidirectional amplifiers instead of our typical EDFAs. Uh, but <clears throat> those systems don't include some kind of management network. And in that regard, it really reminds me of the EWDM system, which we had in the early 2000s, uh, which is mainly just a bunch of amplifiers and OADMs but no real integrated management. In frequency dissemination, one complication often is that the end site, so where your frequency source or destination is, this is usually not your own pop. So you might have your own sites, but the, the end user is somewhere in a lab um, which is not really connected uh, to your network uh, per se. Uh, but this stuff needs management too. One big difference uh, to the to a classical DWDM system is that your bidirectional amplifier needs spectrum isolation. Uh, so because they are bidirectional, they don't uh, include the uh, directional couplers. Uh, so you need to isolate them with narrow filters. As far as I've seen, uh, these are usually just single channel OADMs, basically the same stuff you're using in DWDM just with a single channel. Now, if you consider you already have 
your DWDM system integrating such a thing becomes now relatively easy. You can place your bidirectional amplifier next to your other stuff and hopefully integrate them in your existing management network. Uh, as you have seen from Nicola in the older systems, this might be a bit painful. Uh, in our case, it's really easy. Um, the DWDM node simply has uh, an Ethernet port with a routed VLAN uh, on it. So you might have to add a, a small switch depending on the number of devices you want to add. Uh, but what I've seen, the, the latest generation even includes like a four port Ethernet switch within the chassis itself. So it's pretty easy to connect. The your one channel filters, the OADMs, uh, are actually perfect uh, to double as multiplexers. So you can add your frequency signal to the rest of your spectrum. Uh, if you're using Raman amplifiers, it might be a bit more complicated setup depending on the exact design of, of the amplifier. It might have a, a mid stage L band port, or you put it like on here on the outside uh, but in the end you will uh, you will end up with a, a stack of OADM filters but that's not really uh, a big deal but we still have the end side uh, which we did not have any equipment uh, placed but again the uh, the single channel isolators act as multiplexers and we can actually use the same the very same filters towards the end side and multiplex uh, a management network again simple gigabit sfp uh, and place a small switch uh, at the end side to connect all the rest uh, i've also shown here the, the original specification of our filters, um, which we, we use to order them. So for us, it's a bit special. It's uh, channel seven, uh, just outside the C-band. But from the design, it's, it's really just a single channel uh, OADM. Um, in our case, uh, with all APC E2000 connectors. Um, one thing we encountered uh, when we approached uh, the university where the lab is connected and told them, yeah, well, we are going to bring the management network to your lab. They kind of went defensive and just, well, do not connect this management network to the university network on site. The local admins will see you as a backdoor. So just... <laughs> don't do it or be really careful. It's not the best idea. Um, and it's not really needed because you already provide connection to the lab. Uh, and for the guys working locally in the lab, it's anyway, no big deal. Now, well, we do have remote management established, integrated in the management network. Uh, we as network operators can access all the stuff all well. But really, as we have heard from Nicola, we aren't really operating the frequency link. It's the NMI in our case uh, who is operating this stuff. One endpoint is in their lab. And as long as the user is local in his lab, he can connect to this management network and management network all well. But what if he's not? Somehow he needs to access. He, need, he needs access um, to the network to really do the remote management. And we we had this um, requirement about the same time for for different projects. Uh, so we decided to build uh, a bastion host. You can also do VPNs or, or other kind of stuff uh, 
really depends on what you already have. For us, the, the simple solution was uh, an SSH jump host can double as a SOX5 proxy, uh, where we implement, implemented a per use of firewall. Um, really depends on what exactly you need, who you're working with, and what you might already have. So, for example, those who are working with Giant, Giant, I think, uses some VPN uh, style jump host. So, similar thing um, works quite well and it's simple to set up. So, what did we learn in the past two and a half years of, of operating this? It's really the, the amplifiers work as your normal EDFAs. Don't need, don't need much to do on it once the link is actually running. And this is main, mainly done uh, by the NMI. For the link setup, they actually worked most of the time from their lab. So already connect to the management, can access all the boxes, um, works fine. From our own NOC processes, um, we basically um, see it as a spectrum service. We do, amplif we do amplification, we monitor light levels. Um, besides shutting down the amplifier, we don't really do much on it. And the important thing is don't forget your spectrum services, especially when you have scheduled fiber maintenance don't forget to tell them they are on the same flight or two. And the final thing, what we were missing um, are taps. So taps is just a 1% uh, signal split off um, in each direction. Actually, most DWD, DWDM systems um, include such a tap at the amplifier. So you can control uh, your signal levels. But since we multiplex after the amps, um, we don't really get that. And at least in one case, we really missed it. Uh, so <laughs> it was kind of hard to debug, um, which yeah, is why we actually updated uh, our filter specification for the isolator multiplexer, uh, added, 1% taps in each direction. And these we actually now ordered and are waiting for delivery to inclusion. Really simplifies uh, debugging in case there is any need to. And you can have a look at your full spectrum going on the fiber and not just uh, each um, part on its own. Also, especially for the bidirectional amplifiers, which are really hard to debug uh, if you try to do it while they are not in operation. And to be in operation, they need to be fully connected. All right, that would be about from my side. Um, so I'll have a look at chat. Um, okay, OSNR, DWDM signals. Um, Yes, the OADMs, the multiplexer, do increase link attenuation. Uh, although those single channel filters are very good. We are talking about real life 0.5 dB. They are specified to one or 1.5 dB. Real life, you get somewhere like 0.5 dB for each filter. Um, for us in the DWDM design, we already included um, such applications to add uh, non-DWDM signal on, on the CWDM uh, spectrum. So this was for us no big deal. Um, yeah, you need to, to look, have a look at your own design, whether it's possible or not. And regarding OSNR, yeah, in the end, 1 dB link loss shouldn't be that hard <laughs> on OSNR. Um, as Nicola already said, they are using a channel in the middle of their C-band. 
and still don't get any impact uh, on coherent signals. So for us, slightly outside C-band, it's also absolutely no problem. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. You also take the first question from the chat. So here I can add that, yeah, with careful engineering, it's possible to do even some sorting of filters and, uh, and assigning the best uh, OADMs to the worst segments, so you can definitely mi minimize the impact of uh, increased attenuation. And I would like to encourage the other for giving question to this very interesting talk. Are there any questions? So maybe I I, I would I would have one, yeah, because. Um, uh, yeah, so um, the NRENs which are operating the uh, bidirectional spectrum service, uh, it's very useful to have a, to have a, uh, what you Fabian mentioned to have a taps and see what's uh, happening on the fiber. But uh, uh, Nicholas, do I remember correctly that uh, there have been some issues with having the these uh, monitoring ports in the in the bidirectional network in the bidirection channel. Um, I well, we we had some issue when we were using the GSMs, but uh, with the new uh, Infinera Corian setups, um, no, everything was going well. Uh, okay. We never faced any issue. Mm -hmm. We we had an idea. Well. Uh, as you can see, uh, there are two uh, user ports. Um, we were wondering whether it would be a good idea to have a west connection and an east side connection, uh, if there were some, some fiber link issue on, on the left side, we would lose the connectivity with the all of our uh, amplifier chains. Uh, so that would be a risk, but we preferred uh, to, to have that risk um because it, it wasn't that easy to build uh with, with the existing amplifiers i mean uh but we couldn't uh, configure two gateways uh, and yeah right yeah again that depends on your vendor um mm -hmm. i think the again the the more recent systems um usually uh, do ospf um because they do uh Vason. Uh, on the optical layer, so they need OSPF anyway. Um, and with that, you also have your east-west redundancy. Um, yeah, regarding issues with the the taps, um, this is why we act, we specifically requested um, APC connectors on the tap ports too, just to avoid any reflection um if we, we don't have anything connected um to to the tap ports okay so thank you thank you very much nicholas fabian so please are are any more are there any more questions yeah so i think that uh, christoph uh, question was already regarding snr decrease was already uh, answered by Fabian. So, Fabian, again, thank you very much. And I would like to ask uh, Martin Schlapak from Cessnet. Martin is a colleague uh, of mine, and he will bring a uh, presentation named uh, Bidirectional TF Channels Monitoring. And um, Martin's background is in the uh, mainly computer sciences. Uh, and he is with um, Cessnet Department of Optical Networks since uh, year 2020. And he is not active only in the um, bidirectional spectrum services, uh, mainly the monitoring and performance uh, evaluation. He is also uh, active in the field of uh, quantum key distribution. So. Martin, uh, floor is yours. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the interaction. And 
I would uh, present uh, about the bidirectional TF channel monitoring and not also about the bidirectional, but also around uh, the wall uh, infrastructure based on uh, check light boxes. And I will uh, I will say something about um, the consequences about uh, about the building the monitoring stack. And next, I show some examples of the dashboards from uh, our monitoring infrastructure. And if we have a time at the end of the uh, presentation, I can uh, talk also about the measuring of low level performance of optical link. So uh, Cessnet's uh, bidirectional time and frequency infrastructure uh, consists from five regular lines, as you can see, of total length about uh, 1,000 kilometer. And uh, because you want, uh, don't want to uh, uh, separate the monitoring infrastructure for uh, the monitoring of bidirectional devices and uh, all other devices, uh, the monitoring stack is uh, in general the one for uh, also the BD uh, ETFA amplifiers and also for example for uh, about uh, 90 and other boxes mostly amplifiers but not only there are also uh, reconfigurable adrop multiplexers and some uh, variable uh, multiplexers and uh, the total length of the monitored uh, infrastructure is about nearly uh, 4,000 kilometers. So the bidirectional uh, lines are operated by legacy check lights uh, amplifiers. Uh, that means uh, that we are working, our colleague uh, working uh, on new generation of check lights uh, devices but this presentation is not about the <clears throat> new generation. This is about the monitoring of the old ones. But uh, they are also serving uh, till today. And uh, we expect that their life will be at least uh, several next years. So uh, there are some problems which we have to uh, face. Uh, at first, that the environment which we have to monitor is uh, more heterogeneous than you can expect. It's, uh, it's given by, by the fact that uh, boxes are uh, pushed into the operation state during the years and the oldest one still in service is since uh, 2011. So uh, there are at least two generation of operating system. It's based on our uh, own um, Linux distribution uh, based on Debian and Slack, but uh, there are some modifications. Uh, we take the best from both of, uh, of the systems. And next, uh, what is important to say, uh, is that uh, part of uh, our infrastructure is uh, mentioned as a research and development and another part is as a base service. Uh, so uh, we want to monitor everything, but uh, you have to uh, take, a, take into account uh, also uh, the fact that uh, new people uh, are coming in, some are leaving us. So uh, we are also limited by our available manpower to maintain wall monitoring infrastructure. So uh, uh, the uh, monitoring stack is a living organism and uh, it's continuously developed. Uh, for example, we uh, introduced some time series database uh, uh, this year in, in the winter. And now generally uh, what's uh, what we need, uh, what's, the, what's the basic requirements to our monitoring stack? Uh, we want to be informed uh, about the events which uh, emerge somewhere from the network uh, with different levels of importance and we want to take appropriate action in response. So uh, that's a base, uh, but there are also many other requirements and now is time to say what, uh, what will be nice to have. So this is only for, um, for uh, 
uh, example how we can look, but uh, this is a picture from some China's power grid control center and it's not uh, really related to monitoring of uh, bidirectional infrastructure in Cessnet. So uh, what do we want to have? Uh, at least uh, we want to have uh, monitoring tool with clear and uniform in, uh, front end. Uh, I, you can imagine it as uh, one place uh, from which is uh, possible to uh, perform some uh, queries or uh, view some uh, detailed and configured view on, uh, on the infrastructure. So you want to see the current state, uh, any point in the past uh, when you are uh, going to investigate what what happened sometime during the weekend uh, in the morning, in the in the Monday, and it's uh, very useful to have some history about, for example, optical levels, and you have you are able to say that uh, somewhere in exact exactly time we lost the input signal. And uh, next, you can see some as more nice to have uh, features like uh, automated uh, deployment, uh, push and pull data acquisition, and so on. And uh, also, uh, we, we are going to uh, incorporate uh, the measurement of, of fiber environment. So you can use the lines, uh, especially optical fiber, as a distributed sensor and you can uh, make some measurements and uh, can make uh, later on logged the data, you can uh, perform some computations and see if uh, some events correlate to another and so on. So uh, this is uh, the schema uh, of uh, monitoring uh, infrastructure for BINI channels and not only BINI, as I said, and we have on one side, some monitoring devices, some server with processing uh, scripts uh, and, and data storage this is one, one side. And another um, point of uh, view is the point of view of the operator or user, which can uh, uh, have uh, an option to access uh, different uh, views like uh, some interactive dashboards or uh, export tables, for example, for uh, configuration of firewalls. Uh, and also, you want to track, uh, for example, uh, some notifications from uh, predefined alarms, for example, when you uh, loss of input, uh, input signal. So uh, there are, as, as the... Um, Infrastructure uh, lives for a long time. There are uh, some old uh, technologies and there are emerging some new ones. So uh, actually we are using and utilizing the SNMP protocols, both in version two and three. Uh, we are connecting to boxes over SSH also for grabbing uh, some monitoring data, for example, CMOS battery state and so on. Uh, some marginal data will be grabbed also over HTTPS and, uh, for example, alarms, alarms notifications goes through the email. And in the last line, uh, there is a syslog. Uh, that's a remote system for logging. And th the reason for this one is because the boxes are running from a read-only file system. So when you uh, turn, uh, turn the box off and on, uh, then you lost the logs. Uh, in case you are don't send uh, them to another storage location, for example. So the data are processed by uh, common command line Linux interfaces and programs and tools like Bash, Python, Ansible, uh, Serial, and uh, PostgreSQL client, and so on. And uh, the so-called quick and dirty approach is uh, our um, rule uh, it's not it's not perfect but it's a fact that what's uh, very fit and functional it become permanent the data are stored in uh, postgresql it's because uh, historical purposes and there are no need to change it 
And uh, this year we introduced the time series database for uh, storing, storing the uh, historical data. Uh, the six months of uh, operating uh, give us uh, about uh, 460, uh, not 60, 36 uh, millions of data points. And in Victoria metrics, it's took approximately only six, uh, 60 megabytes on disk. We have very good uh, experiences with Victorian metrics and it serves as a backend for uh, Grafana dashboards. And uh, back to the data storage, also some uh, kind of data are stored on classically on file system like mailboxes or dynamic configurations, for example, Ansible inventories and so on. And the uh, front end consists of two main systems. Uh, the first one is CL Manager. It's uh, our in-house developed CMS content management system for check light boxes. Second one is Grafana and it's used for historically uh, acquired data and for um, investigation of some, some events. Uh, beside these two, we are using uh, Smoke Ping. That's a utility which, are, which is capable to ping the whole network in a very short uh, time intervals. And we can uh, see when, for example, when the IP connectivity uh, was lost. So here are some examples of a dashboard from Grafana. Uh, this is overview of three months and you can see the values, uh, the evolution of values of some sensors. For example, nice uh, is to see how the CMOS battery uh, continuously fade out to some um, low level, about one volt. And uh, you can see that, for example, uh, temperature of laser light is very stable during during the whole uh, three months. Next one is maybe interesting, more interesting, because you can see some uh, changes in optical uh, power levels on the input and also on the output of selected box. Uh, you can see that somebody uh, slightly tuned the input signal, for example, uh, increase the gain on previous amplifier. And uh, in some point of time, uh, for example, the channels are uh, plucked off and uh, the signal uh, was lost on uh, module in end stage one, the, the orange one lines. So the Grafana is uh, capable also to display some information on map. This is only overview of locations of uh, not only BD infrastructure, but all uh, check light boxes and their position in the, on, on the map. And you can display some uh, uh, values also on overlay. This is only static screenshot, but in Grafana you can uh, show, for example, the list of uh, your devices in uh, given given location. Next one is a screenshot from uh, Checklight uh, Manager. That's a content management system for evidence of our boxes. You can see some details uh, about the actual state, about the hardware and software configuration. And next, there, there is an aggregation of uh, different kind of data, something from email, something from remote syslog. And uh, you can also uh, wrote some notes about the box if you if you need. The the next one is example of overview of wall line when you can see that on the uh, transfer uh, from Brno to Ostrava there are uh, four amplifiers on the line, and uh, this actually not uh, fully working, but it's an in debugging process but uh, the intention is to show actual uh, actually span uh, attenuation but actually it's not working uh, perfectly because you can see not available at least on the screenshot so uh, what we have learned during the operating the monitoring infrastructure of bd, BD lines uh, the SNMP version three is very slow and it's due to authentication and authorization. So if you have, uh, for example, separator VLANs and uh, you can afford it, it's better to use uh, older version uh, two of SNMP without the authentication and authorization 
but you have to uh, take into account the circumstances if you if you can mitigate any any unwanted access to your data which are uh, sent unencrypted in version 2 so second one is uh, fact that uh, the ip connectivity to your box can be provided by a third side and when the first side changes some something in their firewall and don't tell you about this that you have a problem you have to go to the location uh, check uh, everything uh, what's yours and see that not your problem that somebody uh, blocks for example access to your box uh, that's maybe uh, the first uh, the third one is uh, maybe a little bit uh, specific for us that then all the boxes have no Python in the custom operating system and Ansible is dependent on uh, Python for performing uh, the tasks of the playbooks and there are some so uh, there's some solution for this and it's called raw command and uh, it's quite uh, powerful and you can pull some interesting statistic even with uh, one-liners in bash and utilizing the raw command next uh, the old one boxes have a problem uh, when you are connecting from new operating system that uh, your client and the server the box in your case did not find a common subset of on site of ciphers and key exchange methods and you are not able to connect so you have to dig into documentation and see how to um, overpass this uh, this issue uh, generally speaking it would be nice to uh, design and develop and test and configure everything from scratch but not that uh, what life is about so we have to live with with what we have and as i said before the temporary solutions became permanent so uh, i i think we have a, a few minutes uh, so uh, about the monitoring of low level uh, performance of the of the link so for the bill transfers it's crucial to minimize the reflection that's uh, simply because every reflected signal even it's very very uh, low uh, power level of the signal it's amplified by the bidirection amplifiers there is no isolators and so on and the signal could affect the channel itself or um, next channels and you want to avoid this situation so it could be handy to be able as uh, previous speaker said uh, to inspect I think I lost connection. Yes. Okay. And okay, Martin. Martin is back. Okay. 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 Martin, do you hear us? Okay. Can I continue? Yeah. Uh huh. Could yeah, you... we lost you for a while. Could you restart? I am on Edurone, so maybe there there was some. Uh, yeah, you are on Wi-Fi. Yeah. So probably we lost you. Uh, uh, mentioning right. that uh, similarly like previous spectrum some osa or spectrum monitoring is a handful yeah okay so uh, i repeat it uh, so it could be handy to be able to inspect the optical spectrum in the line but the osa is expensive and the ocr optical channel monitor have uh, commonly lower resolution so so uh, you can monitor uh, also the quality uh, of link in uh, another point of view or how to say it uh, so you can uh, long term uh, watch on and monitor snrr and another metrics from transporters of course and uh, in case of uh, not modulated signals like uh, wd so uh, we can uh, utilize the continuous wave laser and watch uh, what's happening with its beat node. Uh, it's, neat, uh, it's important to say that uh, you are limited of uh, 
we are limited by lasers coherence length so you cannot uh, use it on too long spans without uh, without uh, not so uh, narrow band uh, laser and based on this experiments we uh, proposed link quality index which is metric uh, which uh, goal is to determine that state of the link, the current state of the link uh, is uh, before uh, the emerging of undesired lasing. So you, when you're tuning the amplifiers, you can say, uh, looking on LQE, uh, you can say now stop, we cannot uh, continue because it's uh, highly probable that the unwanted lasing, uh, thanks to amplified uh, reflections emerge. So uh, this is only a short example how, how the beat notes looks like. Uh, it's uh, image which showing you the beat note itself is the blue one. And there are uh, marked some uh, interesting points and uh, segments. And when you analyzed uh, this one, you can uh, estimate uh, some probability when, when the unwanted lasing, uh, unwanted lasing uh, appear in the line. So uh, if you are interested in this, you can look in the white paper uh, prepared in, in this uh, project and there are some more details about it. And the last one, last slide uh, is a comparison of uh, link quality index and SNR. And we use this link quality index to uh, balance the amplifier sling, the bidirectional amplifier sling. And uh, for example, this grid search uh, diagrams comes uh, from performance on two amplifiers. Uh, the one amplifier uh, driving current is on the X and second one on uh, Y axis. And you can see the value of the link quality index. So much uh, yellower uh, means that the index is higher. The violet one are the uh, states when the link quality index is low. And you can see that there are uh, quite nice uh, gradient and you can use this matrix to automatic uh, tuning or guide the, um, guide the operator how to tune the amplifiers and say the best is somewhere in the yellow area. And for comparison, SNR is uh, quite flat from this point of view. There is no such gradient. Uh, quite good is on the side, uh, left side and bottom, but not on the other side in the uh, la right top corner. And uh, it's difficult to guide where is good uh, combination of driving current of two amplifiers when are you moving in this area. And uh, that's all for my presentation. Thank you. So Martin, thank, thank you very much. And the uh, presentation is uh, open for questions. So please, are there any questions? So if there are no questions, I would like uh, to uh, give a one. So you mentioned that uh, there is necessary to have a CW laser for, let's say, the measuring the quality of, uh, of uh, coherent optical frequency tr transfer. Is it really necessary or? Uh, I think that's a question for you, user, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's my it's my question too, which I'm trying to uh, make this more clear for other other people. I, uh, unfortunately, yeah, yeah, uh, unfortunately, yeah. I think that you have a modulated signal. You cannot expect so so clear uh, beat note, and you have to uh, analyze and separate the impact of uh, of the modulation method. I think. But no, no, sure. I thought I thought if it's possible to use the uh, coherent uh, optical frequency transfer itself. Okay, no, no problem. 
So there was a question about uh, the references ask for the white paper that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, after closing the first uh, part of uh, um, InfoShare, I will send uh, this link to the this link to, to the chat. So if there are no questions, thank you very much for your uh, kind attention and probably uh, Xavier will announce uh, where yeah. we, if it, it would be possible to start uh, earlier or we will keep the... Well, we, we have the uh, 10 minutes uh, ahead uh, of our schedule. So maybe what we can do is to <clears throat> to have a 20 minute break and, and, and we'll start at, at 3 p.m. Uh, I would like also to mention that uh, uh, this uh, OT, uh, OTFN working group is also preparing a white paper that is just uh, under review and will be published uh, very soon and we will send you uh, uh, the link. Uh, and, and, and the purpose of this white paper is especially management and monitoring. So you will have uh, more details uh, from all of the speakers that you have, well, not all, but most of them. So let's keep, uh, let's uh, have a, a coffee break and we start at, at 3 p.m. If you want to. So, thank you very much. Okay, see you at thank you, Joseph. three. Thank you to the speakers. Okay, so we, we we will restart. This is the second session of this info share. Uh, as this uh, second session will be shared by uh, Suzanne uh, Najib Takson. So, Suzanne, the floor is yours. Welcome to the session number two of this info share. It is dedicated completely to the topic of uh, white rabbit technology. And we will have three different presentations about the topic, different aspects of it. And I think I'm not promising too much if I say it will be equally exciting as uh, session number one. So um, let's start with uh, the first presentation. It is entitled White Rabbit. It is by Maciej Lipinski. Uh, Maciej Lipinski graduated in telecommunications, electronics, and informatics uh, with a PhD, and uh, he's a specialist in control and timing at CERN, and he has been working there since uh, 2010. And uh, he's a co-author of the Wide Rabbit Extension to Precision Time Protocol IEEE 1588 standard. He's responsible for the White Rabbit standardization and co-chair of the committee introducing new features to the IEEE 1588 standard. And if you've ever read a publication on um, White Rabbit, uh, you have probably uh, read something that was either authored or co-authored uh, by him. Chances are very high. So we're very much looking forward uh, to your presentation. Uh, Matze, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, can you confirm that you can hear me well? Yes, we can hear you very fine. Okay, so welcome after the break. I hope you had a good coffee. Uh, so my name is Maciej Lipinski. I work at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, in particular in uh, beams, uh, consoles, electronics, mechatronics, and electronics design and low-level software uh, section, which is providing basically a, a generic uh, hardware and low-level software to control accelerators, and one of this is White Rabbit. Uh, so the agenda for today is as follows. I will make a brief introduction and lay, lay out a bit of basics for the technology. So we have the common grounds to understand later the equipment, the calibration, and the configuration of White Rabbit. And then I will summarize in hopefully 40 minutes. Uh, so uh, what is White Rabbit? So YW is the name of a project and a technology that was initiated by CERN and also GSI and other accelerator in Germany uh, to provide the new next generation control and timing system for accelerators. And purposely, it was based on well-established standards and those are Ethernet and bridge local area networks. So this basically is what you possibly use every day if you go to your office and you 
uh, connect your PC to the socket in the wall. You are using Ethernet and Bridge Localia network. And then maybe people in my age also did uh, throw the LAN party so then they would remember it from that angle. Then the second technology is precision time protocol, which is an industry standard to synchronize uh, devices, actuators uh, in power plants, uh, factories, but also airplanes or soon cars. So in principle, a wide rabbit network can be seen as a standard Ethernet network that is uh, composed of uh, Ethernet switches, which are called wide rabbit switches, and then end stations, which are uh, wide rabbit uh, nodes in our nomenclature. But as well, you can connect a standard Gigabit Ethernet switch or a standard uh, PC to this network and everything will work. And now on top of this, we have some uh, bonuses, I would say. So wide rabbit adds deterministic data transfer meaning that uh, network guarantees an upper bound latency between, uh, let's say a controller that sends information that is to control, for example, accelerators and the end nodes. So you can calculate what is the upper bound latency for the network and this is guaranteed and provide some second synchronization between uh, the source of time. So the, we call it grandmaster and all the wide rabbit devices in the network. Uh, they are all synchronized within one nanosecond. Now the, the focus on this presentation is on the management with an angle on, on the sub nanosecond synchronization. And also this part has been incorporate, incorporated into the IEEE 1588 2019 standard as high accuracy uh, prof default profile. Now the, uh, the uh, white rabbit was initiated, the initial specs for white rabbit were links up to 10 kilometers and around 2000 nodes in the network, but this has been already exceeded by far and you will see. Uh, the open, the white is basically open source and commercially available. So those are two uh, non-exclusive terms. So something can be both open source and commercially available. So sold uh, and you can buy basically out of the box switches, which are still open. Uh, in terms of applications and users, there are many. Of course, CERN and GSI are using Wide Rabbit. Uh, then we, uh, Wide Rabbit is used, for example, in the large high altitude air shower observatory in Tibet uh, to uh, synchronize uh, hundreds of detectors that you can see on the pictures, uh, like this uh, round thing thingies. <laughs> and this is uh, then used to timestamp uh, particles coming from air and then uh, basically try and uh, figure out the angle from, so the trajectory from which they, they arrived to make some studies. Then it's also used in the uh, cubic kilometer neutrino uh, telescope or detector that is uh, being installed at the bed of the Med Mediterranean Sea. This is again, all these uh, bulbs are synchronized and then they measure the uh, time of arrival and then the angle of arrival uh, of uh, neutrinos through detecting the turn of light. Uh, YW is also used for us at German Stock Exchange here to monitor the high frequency trading uh, market. Uh, national laboratories use YW. The first one to use YW was Finnish National Laboratory and they still hold the record of the longest YW link, which is almost 1000 kilometers. But there are also other national laboratories that use wide rabbit either for long distance or locally to distribute uh, 10 megahertz and PPS in the facility between uh, labs and between buildings. Uh, finally, ESA was also looking in evaluating wide rabbit and they had, I think, the first international link uh, between countries in Europe. So this is just a, a few examples. There are many and you can have a look at the web page. So now, the technology, how wide rabbit works in brief. So uh, as I said, why we are focusing on this synchronization here. And as I said, wide rabbit is based on gigabit Ethernet, and this is over fiber and precision time protocol. And then we extend it with layer one synchronization, uh, uh, a fancy way of phase detection. So this is called digital dual mixer time difference, DDMTD, and link delay model. So now I will go through each, each of, the, of, of the points. So first of all, I guess you are familiar with uh, Gigabit Ethernet is. It, just to say that YWZ switch is a layer two switch that works with MAC addresses. So it's not a router to work with IP. Of course, you can write, run IP traffic over a switch, no problem. But in principle, 
it's a it's a switch, so it, it looks at MAC addresses and forwards traffic accordingly at gigabit Ethernet. Uh, then the precision time protocol is a frame-based synchronization protocol. That means that it exchanges uh, frames or packets uh, to synchronize devices. So if so, the two devices that are connected with a link, so device A, device B, they exchange messages, uh, which are called PTP messages. And uh, these messages are timestamped, meaning that when a message is sent, the device sending the message is, is, snap, is basically freezing the, the time of sending it with its local time scale, whatever it is. And then the, time, the, the device that is receiving the message is again time stamping, so recording the time of arrival of the message in its local time scale. So those are initially not synchronized. So this happens uh, between the devices, and we end up with four timestamps. And then uh, we can do some school, uh, primary school math uh, to figure out the, uh, the delay of the, of the link between the two devices. And this is done assuming that the, the, the delay in one direction and in the other direction is symmetric. Uh, this is the starting point. So if we assume that this is basically the same time it takes to go in one direction and the other, then we can easily figure out uh, the, the delay in one direction, just dividing the round trip by two. And then we can also easily figure out the offset from the master device to the slave device to correct the time of the slave device. And in the end, we have the two devices working, uh, ha having the same notion of, of time to some uh, accuracy. And then this accuracy for the, the standard PTP uh, can be microseconds or Sub microseconds, uh, even hundreds of hundred nanoseconds, but this was not enough uh, for us at CERN. So we ex so we basically identified some shortcomings of PDP and then found solutions to uh, to overcome them. But okay, just one point is that what you see here, so the link uh, synchronization, is repeated over the entire network. So in the network we have one device that is connected to the truth, so the source of time like GPS, and then the synchronization happens on in a hierarchical order, so from the grandmaster downstream between each of the devices, and then all of the devices are synchronized. So coming back to the shortcomings of initial PTP, uh, those were that, first of all, in, in standard implementation of PTP, each device has a free running oscillator, which has some uh, finite uh, stability. That means that during the exchange of, of messages or between the measurements, uh, the, the time base can drift. And this uh, decreases the accuracy of, of synchronization itself. And uh, the more you, you want to have, the more accurate synchronization you, you, you want, the more messages you need to exchange, but it's, always, it's not always enough. So the second problem is that uh, the, ass the assumption about a symmetry of medium is not true, never, almost never. Uh, and the third problem is the timestamping resolution. Most of the PDP devices, they use the uh, line mm -hmm. clock to timestamp, uh, which is for gigabit Ethernet is uh, eight nanoseconds of resolution, plus minus eight nanoseconds. Uh, so you, you cannot uh, synchronize more precisely than the, uh, the resolution of your timestamps. Mm -hmm. So what happened is that uh, uh, we fixed all of these problems. So first of all, uh, the free running oscillators. So we are using layer one synchronization, which is very much like syncing. And what is how it works is that basically the, uh, the device that is connected to a, a reference of, of frequency, it, it uses this, uh, this frequency to encode the data that is sending, so the gigabit internet. And then the downstream device is recovering the clock from the data and using this clock for its operation and then again using it to send the data downstream and also to send the data back to the master. This gives us two advantages. One is that the entire network works with the very same frequency and since everything is happening on, at the physical layer, uh, the recovery of the frequency can be high quality. So we end up with a high quality of frequency distributions, distribution already over the entire network. And then the second thing is that we have this loopback. So the, so the frequency that is sent by the master uh, goes to, to the slave device and then goes back to the master. So we have a replica of the, of the uh, signal 
uh, which is high stability. So the phase between the, the transmission and reception is not changing much. And that allows us to use uh, phase detection uh, to enhance the precision of the timestamps. And this is what we do. We are using uh, this uh, digital dual mixer time difference phase detector, which is basically uh, a phase detector. So you, can, you could use any phase detector, but this one is particularly well suited for implementation in FPGAs that we are using because it's, it really uses very few resources and it gives quite a very good performance. So just in short, if we have these two clocks uh, that we want to measure phase between, uh, first of all, we are producing another clock signal, which is slightly off. So if, if we are using 62.5 megahertz, then we are the, the slightly off signal would, would have 62.4961. So it is very slightly shifted in frequency. And we are using this, uh, this offset uh, clock to, to basically uh, uh, as an input to, to clock the, the D flip flops. Uh, story short, uh, what is happening is that on the output, we have a much slower clock that has the, the phase, the phase relation, relation is, is preserved so we can measure precisely the, the phase. And for example, in, in this setup with 62.5 megahertz, we are reaching the third high resolution of one picosecond. So this is just to say that we are, we, we are doing the phase detection. And then with the phase detection, uh, we have very precise timestamps. So what we can do, we can precisely measure the round trip, uh, but we still don't know what is the delay from one to the other. Uh, so the one-way delay uh, over the over the medium, and this is because there are asymmetries on the way. So the, the medium is never symmetric, and uh, the asymmetry can can come from the delays in FPGA because we are using FPGA in the PCB because if, if we are working at uh, picoseconds level, then the trace length is matters of the, from the SFPs uh, and so on, and also so and also from the fiber itself. We are using single strand, single mode fiber for two-way communication. So that means that we are using one wavelength in one direction and then a, a different wavelength in the other direction. So this also creates asymmetry. So what we did, we made a, a model, a simplistic model, in which we divide the, AC, the asymmetries into, or the delays into two types. The fixed delays, those are the delays that would not change to the first order. So they they are derived from the delays of the hardware. So the SFP, FPJ, and so on. And then we uh, distinguish the variable delays, which are basically, which is the delay introduced by the fiber itself. And this can change because the temperature of the fiber changes because the length of the fiber changes. So uh, if, so in total, if we have the precise round trip, uh, round trip and we know the, the delays, the fixed delays and, and the variable delays, we can then compensate uh, the, the offset. So calculate the very precise delay from master to slave, and then the offset and correct to some nanosecond. Uh, so what is to take from this slide is that basically we need very precise measurement of timestamps and then corrections for some uh, delays uh, and uh, basically a medium that we know the relation between uh, uh, delay in one direction and the other. And here, uh, this is ensured in our case by the fact that we are using a uh, single fiber for two-way communication. And we, we know the wavelengths in one direction and the other. So with all this, uh, what we get is uh, very good synchronization, at least in our terms, because uh, you can do, of course, better with SLAB, for example. Uh, so this is uh, something that has been showing in slides for many, many years, uh, the evaluation of uh, synchronization of white rabbit, where we had a uh, few white rabbit switches connected th through kilometers of fiber. And then we compared the PPS output with a scope and we simulated uh, the variable conditions with our favorite toy, hot, hotel gun. With this, what we got is that we synchronized so if, you, if the master is at zero offset, the next uh, device, the blue, would, was uh, off uh, by 
160 picoseconds. This is the mean and standard deviation, five, six, five picoseconds. Then uh, we got a bit lucky, and the other device was uh, in the other, the offset was in the other direction, and then the uh, next device. All in all, uh, the synchronization of a chain of uh, three switches was within one nanosecond, even within half a nanosecond. So this is the synchronization over uh, three switches. Now I did a bit more of uh, experiments and you have, you see here a chain of 10 switches because uh, I thought that maybe you would be interested in, in, in a longer chain. And then uh, we see performance here in two cases. One, when the switches were, were not carefully uh, calibrated. Uh, so calibrated meaning all the fixed delays that I've been mentioning a few, a few slides before and the other that they were really carefully calibrated. Uh, so the red one is not carefully calibrated and the bluish uh, is the carefully calibrated. And we have the mean offset, so what we call accuracy, uh, over one hop, two hops, three hops, uh, uh, up to nine, and the, pre uh, the precision which we measure at standard deviation. So you can see that the calibration does not affect the, the precision. Uh, and then uh, the accuracy, of course, is better if you calibrate. Uh, still, uh, in both cases, it would be below uh, plus minus half a, a nanosecond. Uh, can we do better? Yes, we can. Uh, recently, we had an application where we had to increase uh, the performance of White Rabbit. And uh, the best we can do currently on a single link is an accuracy below uh, 10 picoseconds and the RMS uh, jitter below 100 femtoseconds. Uh, so this is with, with a special version of the switch called door jitter, and I will speak about this later. So this is basically about the, uh, the technology, just a very short introduction, and then coming to the equipment. So in the wide W network, we have two types of devices. We have the wide W switches, which are, uh, as I said, layer two switches, and the end nodes, uh, which we call wide W nodes, which are the end devices. So the switch is a, a central uh, player in the network. It's a 18 port gigabit ethernet switch with the wide bit features. Uh, with, we are using by default the optical transceivers up to 10 kilometers single mode fiber. And this one is completely open source and commercial available from four companies. Uh, now, uh, once we started using it, we found uh, that uh, some things can be improved. And this is what we did with, with an uh, ad hoc board. So uh, this is called a low jitter uh, board that can be plugged on top uh, in, inside the switch. And it adds some extra PLS and better uh, uh, oscillator to improve the performance of the switch. So a white rabbit switch with this board plugged inside or integrated into the main electronics is called a low jitter variant of a white rabbit switch. Uh, so then uh, I was asked about different versions of wide bit switch. So we have actually two uh, types of wide bit switches. Uh, one is the standard one and the other is the low jitter one. And the low jitter one is basic, has basically this uh, low jitter features implemented. What are the differences? Uh, so uh, the differences are that uh, the the uh, jitter of the low jitter switch is, is lower. So if, if we translate it into the precision of standard deviation, the difference is between uh, uh, per link uh, below uh, 10 picoseconds or below one picosecond. Uh, yes, then, then uh, if you look at the modified Allen deviation, you, can all, you have a plot here and clearly uh, the, the standard one is in, in the upper, so the standard uh, switches are the black and the, uh, wait, uh, let me see, where the boundary, yes, uh, the green is for the grandmaster, and the, uh, and the uh, black is, is for the standard. So one important thing about the logitech switch is that it improves two things. One is the input to the grandmaster, Mean that if you connect to the to the GPS, uh, the low jitter switch uh, will uh, has a better input stage, and that means that the the base of the time for the entire wide rabbit network is improved, and you can see it here. So the grandmaster is the one that is connected to the GPS, and uh, if you have the standard one, which is the uh, green one, 
it, it has a, a worse performance uh, than the low jitter one, which is the uh, red one. Okay, so you start the white rabbit already with lower jitter, and then if you, uh, when you use the switch as a boundary clock, and I will explain the differences in a few slides, then it also provides a better distribution of time. So that means that uh, if you are using low jitter switch, you need to have the entire chain of low jitter to make for it to make sense. Otherwise, it will not improve the uh, fully the performance. Then one one uh, more important thing about the switches is that it has two types of ports. Uh, that's why we have this table. Uh, so we the, the ports one to twelve they implement something which we call low phase drift calibration, and this in turn improves the accuracy of synchronization. So the, the low jitter variant of switch improves the uh, precision, whereas uh, regardless of the type of the switch, we have uh, uh, we have ports 1 to 12 that, that have better accuracy, and the ports 13 to 18, which provide worse accuracy. And this you can see here, in principle, the, the worst accuracy is per link around 100 picoseconds, and the improved, so, so if you connect two switches through ports 13, 18, you would, would expect uh, the accuracy within 100 picoseconds. If you, ex if you connect this, uh, these two switches with ports 1 to 12, it would be below uh, 10 picoseconds. So this is also important. It's, it's, it's a matrix. Uh, if you care about really good synchronization, then this is for you. If you just want some nanosecond, then uh, you don't care much. Uh, then we are now developing uh, a new generation of white rabbit switch, uh, which is, I think, important uh, to know for the future plans. And this is uh, a switch which will have uh, support for 24 ports and 1 gig and 10 gig with white rabbit features. It is meant to have redundancy uh, incorporated. That means redundant and hot swappable uh, power supplies and fan, and also expansion board uh, in the back. And this is to, for example, uh, include a better oscillator and have a holdover capabilities. So basically, you can enhance, you can enhance the switch. It's also fully open design. And now a second type of devices in the YW network are the nodes. So the nodes are the end devices. And the nodes are a bit uh, interesting because a node is basically a, an IP core, VHDL IP core, that we provide, which, which we call the YWPTP core. And it it instantiates so it inside in in the FP, in the FPGA core which is written in um, VHDL and very local mix, you have a CPU that is running the the, the software needed for for White Rabbit so the PTP stack with White Rabbit features, and it it also it is also a network interface so it it basically provides you with data the Ethernet data, so it it, it has basic interface to provide. Uh, to output the time of day, white rabbit precision time of day, and the data, which is not PTP data. And this core is instantiated in FPGA and you basically with user specific logic uh, that uh, takes the time and the data. And then this FPGA, uh, and basically there's a large number of hardware that is compatible with white rabbit and can use this, uh, this uh, core. So for example, at CERN, we are using this notion of carrier mezzanine, where we have carriers that support white rabbit in different form factors like PCI, VME, PXI, and so on. And those are generic. And then we use FMCs, so small boards, which with different functionalities like find delay, time to digital, and so on. And all together, they, they, they create a, a plateau of different uh, functionalities of white rabbit uh, nodes but I think you are more interested in those switches. So all in all for the devices of White Rabbit, we have, uh, there's lots of devices. Uh, the White Rabbit switches are available from uh, four vendors and some of them provide two variants. Uh, so for example, seven solutions would have the low jitter variant and non and the standard variant. The OPNT would have also the low jitter variant and standard variant. Uh, the, the Chinese switch, the sync technology, it already incorporates the low jitter features. So you just buy one and you have the better performance. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of, but in principle, all of this is, is roughly, is the same, is the same internals, uh, which are uh, open source. So they are just different colors and two variants. 
Uh, then we have the nodes. The nodes, uh, we have two types, the open source nodes and the proprietary nodes. So there are companies that basically take the, the IP core and use them in their devices that are in terms uh, proprietary. So, we, so they are not open source. And I think this is very, very important when you are looking for wide drive devices. So the wide drive switches, all of them are open source, but for the end nodes, uh, there are some devices that are proprietary and it's not always evident that they are. So you are buying a device that you think is open source, but in the end it's not. And uh, bear in mind that uh, the wide rabbit community do not provide much support for proprietary solutions because what, we don't know what is inside, so we cannot help you. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind uh, to make sure that it's clear to distinguish between proprietary and open source. We have this web page that lists them uh, so you can see which are which are which and what companies are producing what. We try to keep it up to date. So then the calibration, because uh, I was asked to speak a bit about calibration. So the calibration, basically, the, why we calibrate? We calibrate to ensure some nanosecond accuracy. So it's all about accuracy of, of time synchronization. So, so through the uh, calibration, we, we ensure the, uh, the some nanosecond accuracy between the output of the grandmaster, so the, the one that is connected very likely to GPS or to video clock or to, to, to season clock, and the output, the PPS output of all the other switches and nodes. Okay. Uh, and the PPS is produced by the 10, uh, basically is aligned with the 10 megahertz. So, but, but this is, so what we calibrate is the PPS output. Uh, then why do we calibrate and what, what we determine for calibration? Through calibration, we determine two things. One is this ingress, what we call ingress, ingress latencies or fixed delays, which are the delays introduced by hardware. So the FPGA, SFP, PCB, and so on. And then the other thing that we calibrate is the relative delay coefficient of the fiber itself. So we, ca we calibrate the delays introduced by the hardware, and we calibrate the relation of the delay in one direction and the other through the fiber. And then uh, this calibration must be performed. So for the ingress, ingress latency for each device type, each port, each SFP type, and each release. Because if you change the FPGA firmware, the delays internally change, okay? And of course, you, uh, we uh, perform it for the device type, but uh, of course, between the units, there are also some differences. So if you want to be super precise, you could calibrate even for each device individually. So it all depends on what you need. And then we also, you also need to calibrate for each fiber type that you have deployed. Because even if you are using the same wavelengths, the chromatic dispersion and so on may, may depend on the fiber type. So at CERN we are using a single fiber type everywhere. So we just uh, calibrated for one type and that, that works for us. Uh, the procedures are described in the document, which is linked. So everything that is in blue, it has a link, so you can click and go. And the calibration values for the wide bit switches uh, are provided. So if you buy a wide bit switch out of, uh, from a company, you, you would have the calibration values provided for the typical SFPs that we are using and for the fiber that we are using. Uh, and for the nodes, it's a bit more tricky because usually the nodes are not used out of the box, but you take the device, you add some your logic, you resynthesize. Uh, so you need to calibrate in most of the cases yourself. But if you are, we are providing these values for for the reference designs. So we have a we have reference designs, and if we make a release, uh, you have the values so you can start playing. But then in the end, you will have to calibrate possibly yourself. Uh, some useful links uh, about SFPs that we are using calibration are provided here. And now, how do we calibrate? I will not go into details, but just to have highlights of what is what it takes to calibrate. So first of all, it is a lab uh, in lab procedure. So you need to take your the, the one one of the type of the devices that you are using, uh, the one of the type of SFPs that you are using, and the fiber type in your lab, and you need a scope or a time, time interval counter to do it. And then. Basically, what, what you need to do, you need to connect everything, access the device because it will provide some informa information that you need to use. 
and then measure the offset between the PPSs between the devices using scope or time interval counter. Uh, and th there is a step-by-step -step procedure how to do it. Uh, importantly, um, uh, the calibration of the ingress ingress latencies, so the fixed delays, so the delays introduced by hardware is, the, is a relative calibration against a calibrator uh, or a golden calibrator. So at CERN, we have a golden calibrator and for each release of the switch, we are calibrated against our golden calibrator. And that, that means that if you connect switches against each other, they will synchronize nicely. And now there's a procedure to make out of, of, a, of a release switch, your own local calibrator to calibrate your devices. It, because there is a measurement chain, you will lose a bit on, on precision accuracy, but there is, this allows you uh, to have your own instance of calibrator and to calibrate your stuff. Another option is to, if you want to cali calibrate all the devices in your, ne on, in your network, you, you can have your own golden calibrator for yourself. But then you need, you basically, you, you need to override the, the provided uh, data from release. It's not a problem in any case. Uh, so for the, for the relative delay coefficient for the fiber, it is more like an absolute calibration. So uh, meaning that you don't have uh, a calibrator. You basically take your, uh, because it's a, you, measure, you are measuring the rel uh, re uh, relative coefficient, which is relative. Uh, so you, it's, it's basically a, a ratio between one direction and the other. Uh, what, uh, if we measure at CERN ourselves and, uh, and you measure for the same type at your place, we will get to the same value. So there is no need for a, a, a golden calibrator. Uh, it's important to know that in principle, you should know the, the type of fiber that you are using and it doesn't account for active elements. So if you have an amplifier on the way that basically uh, destroys the entire asymmetry uh, calculation in wide, wide rabbit. So amplifiers are to be avoided. There's an ongoing effort for in situ calibration of, of uh, relative delay coefficient. So there's an experimental method to do it. So we know how to do in situ. So you, you don't need to have the fiber in your lab. You can measure the already deployed fiber. And actually we are standardizing this in IT So in a few years, this the, the procedure to do it should become a standard in PTP uh, standard. <laughs> uh, so then coming to the configuration itself, uh, First of all, uh, YDAV is an extension of Ethernet. So that means that uh, it implements a lot of uh, standard protocols and tools. And Adam will be speaking in his presentation a lot about what is there for monitoring in, in a standard way. So I will not uh, go into details. You can also use a lot of standard tools for debugging. And then for the configuration on which I will focus and mostly on the configuration of the switch, uh, there are three methods to configure a switch. If you have a large network, uh, it is recommended that, that the, each, all the switches uh, download configuration file. So we, we have, uh, so the entire configuration of a switch is, is uh, in one file uh, that the switch can automatically download. And this is called .config file. Okay, it, 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 the format is like a, a configuration of a, uh, Linux kernel or build root and so on. It's it's a, a very geeky, but okay. It's 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 a simple text text file that you can uh, that you can edit or you can, you can auto generate. And if you have a large network like, like we have at CERN, we have tools to to basically generate it, and then the switch when it boots automatically automatically uh, downloads this file. Alternatively, if you have a, a smaller network, uh, you can use command line interface uh, in the in the switch itself to generate this file locally. And this is done through menu config. Uh, and again, this is a tool that is typically used when you want to configure uh, a kernel that you are compiling or some more advanced software. And then there's a first third method that we uh, truly discourage, uh, but it still exists. So I need to mention it. Uh, the YW switch has a web interface and a limited subset of the, uh, of the options can be configured still through this interface. Uh, but it's a, it's a very limited number of options. And uh, because we discourage it, we actually disable it by default. So we need to go to use the menu config to actually enable this interface first, and then you can use it. 
so those are the configuration methods. Then what can you actually configure? Uh, so there is a number of things you can configure in, in the switch. Uh, you can configure things that are generic for the device, like IP of a management port, enable, disable different services. Adam will speak about this. Because it's an Ethernet switch, layer two switch, we can configure different uh, forwarding. So the, for the data plane, you have, you have a lot of stuff that you can configure, for example, VLANs, uh, some forwarding options to enable this deterministic enhancements. Uh, and know that it, uh, whether it switch is a managed switch, but the number of options uh, is limited. So for example, we are, uh, there is no implementation of rapid or spanning tree protocol, for example, in the switch in terms of the data plane. Now for the time plane, uh, there are two types of things that you can uh, configure. One is the uh, PTP generic. So those you would encounter anyway in any device that implements PTP and then more specific to the white rabbit. So I will go through those. Uh, so first of all, you can configure the, uh, the role of the device. So in your wide rabbit network, uh, you would have one device at least that would be a grandmaster that would be connected to the GPS or uh, rubidium uh, or cesium. And that, and so you need to configure this, the wide rabbit switch connected to this device as a grandmaster. And then this grandmaster requires the PP, PPS and PPS and 10 megahertz outputs. And uh, it, it, there is some useful information about uh, the characteristics of the input clocks and the relation in phase in the node that is linked. So if you have, if you connect it and you have problems, go to this uh, link. Then free running master is basically a grandmaster, but without the connection of PPS. And it's usually used only if you play around. And then all the other switches would be boundary clocks. So they would have one port that would go, that would synchronize to the upstream. And then all it's called slave port, and all the other ports would be basically giving the information downstream. Now, uh, uh, White Rabbit is taking uh, needs to know the leap second information uh, because this is propagated, and actually it is taking the PPS and 10 megahertz from uh, from GPS, but the, the UTC time is taken from MTP server. So we need to configure the MTP server to take the information about the time. Uh, the roles of the ports, uh, so you, you have two options. You can make the network statically and, or you can make it automatic. Uh, the automatic allows you to uh, basically recover from uh, some failures of, of the net. If one of the devices failed, fails, you can, the network will reconfigure automatically, but this is not seamless by no means. So you will have interaction in time, but it will be very short. At CERN and many other places, we use uh, static configuration uh, meaning that the, the roles of the ports are pre-assigned and, and that's it. Uh, mapping, so you can uh, have the protocol running over the raw Ethernet or UDP IP of your choice. And then you can, for the raw Ethernet, you can use VLANs. So if you are using for your data plane VLANs, then you can uh, say in which VLAN the PTP synchronization should work. And then you can set each port to either be white rabbit. So to synchronize with White Rabbit, and this is compatible with, with the standard PTP, meaning that if you connect a device that is just a default PTP profile, it will also work. But you can co configure the ports to just work with PTP or to have no synchronization whatsoever. Now going to the P uh, White Rabbit specific configuration, uh, you need to configure the ingress egress latencies. So again, we go to the, to the things that you either uh, calibrate it or you, you use the, the, the values that we provide in the releases. Uh, this is part of configuration. Uh, so as I remind you that this is specific for the given device type port and firmware, and those values are automatically chosen. So if you plug in the SFP, the switch will read the type of the SFP and then look into the database, which is in the configuration file to find the values which correspond to your, to your SFP. And uh, we provide values for typical SFPs that, that we use. So on the switch, as I said, uh, the, if you buy a switch, they are calibrated for typical SFPs. And the database for the, for the, for the values is in the .config file. For the nodes, so if you are interested in the nodes, uh, we provide these values for reference designs. 
but the database you need to configure over SNMP. So basically you would, you would uh, provide these values for the SNMP set or through, shells, uh, through the shell command. Uh, yes, so it's not, it's not uh, out of the box. Now, the other thing is the uh, fibers relative day coefficient. Uh, so as I said, we provide the value for the fibers used at CERN. And if, if you are using different fibers, then you need to calibrate this value and then you input it into the database in the .config. But the, the type of the fiber is not detected automatically. So that means that you need to configure by hand what type of fibers you are using for each of the, uh, of the links, because there's no way to, to detect the type of fiber automatically. Uh, then the values for SFPs and fiber types can be determined using the calibration, which I, which I mentioned. And it's, it's quite straightforward procedure, and then you can be easily added to the configuration. Just to mention, and Adam will say more about this, and I'm running out of time. For managing and configuring YWIT switches, uh, typically there is a management network, which is connected to the management port. For configuration of the YWIT devices, uh, nodes, or, so the end stations, usually they are typically they are configured through the wide network itself. So you would so you would basically uh, monitor configure uh, the switches through the management network, but monitor configure the wide nodes through the wide network. Of course, they can be interconnected, but it all depends on the your security and so on how you want to how it's uh, done. It's all, it's, this is all Ethernet networks, so you can, of course, connect them. We have them separated for safety reasons. So this is a, a, a net architecture of a network at CERN. Uh, the important thing is that we have a layer of grandmasters uh, with possibility of having redundancy, but it's not implemented. Then the backbone, and importantly, between grandmasters and the backbone, we exchange only information about the time. And then, uh, in the backbone, we have the, man, we have the management uh, and the configuration of the nodes. So this uh, Nemo is, is a server which speaks with the end nodes for the YW network. And then we have different applications because we have many applications at CERN. They are logically separated through VLANs. So the exchange is between uh, the grandmaster and the backbone layers only time, between backbone layer and the next layer, time and diagnostics, but no data of applications. So just to summarize, uh, YW is an Ethernet-based sol uh, synchronization solution that provides essentially some second accuracy and below picosecond precision out of the box. And you can do better if you are using uh, this uh, low jitter variant. Uh, it's open source with commercial support, uh, standard-based and extending standards because uh, the solutions were included into IEEE 1588 standard, as I said. Uh, it's a versatile solution for generic control and data acquisition uh, and synchronization. So it, the number of applications has exceeded our, our expectations. And I think it's a showcase of a technology transfer from CERN to outside. And that's about it, a bit over time. Apologies for this. This is the White Rabbit team. Uh, you can see Adam and me in here uh, some time ago. So it's uh, just to show you that there is more people behind the project. Uh, okay, so if you have any questions, sorry for being a bit over time, uh, let me know. I see there was a lot of traffic on the chat, but I did not follow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, we do have quite a number of questions. Um, I think the first one that has not been answered yet is from Vladimir, to um, referring to slide number 20, how to understand to what is referenced the 10 PS accuracy. Okay, number 20, I'm going to number 20. Um, uh, uh -huh. ah, uh, 20, okay, so the 10 picoseconds is basically on link by link basis. So if you connect two devices, uh, then they will, the PPS output will be within 10 picoseconds mean with standard deviation of one picosecond. And this will be persistent over reboots. Mm. Mm, uh, just, uh... Okay, I, I have one master I, I, and uh, let's say two slaves. Mm -hmm. I, uh, where I can measure that 10 picosecond because 
whatever I try to measure in the past uh, using uh, technical counter, I never reach uh, uh, numbers uh, below, let's say, 100 picosecond and so on. Uh, so this it, it, it is a single short measurement, or it is some average over some longer time, or it's TDEF, or what is the what is what is the 10 picosecond? So um, by accuracy, we mean we mean the mean value over a number of measurements. Uh, okay. And the precision is standard deviation. So you, you mean the standard deviation or TDEF? Stand, so accuracy is the mean, straight mean, straight average. And the precision is the is the uh, standard deviation. Okay. Not TDEF, but SDEF. OK, SDEF. And uh, 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 over how long uh, interval is that the measurement? It's, it's not too much of a very thing I know. You, you can do it over a okay, few minutes, and this should give you the 10 picoseconds. Now, uh, when you are doing the measurements, which release version of the switch did you use? Because th this 10 picoseconds we introduced only in the newest release. Uh, newest release means uh, to six. last year, or what is newest release? Uh, six six dot zero. So that was already, I think, in last year. I don't remember exactly. Okay, so just, uh, I I I did the measurement uh, just uh, in January or February with. Uh, Seven solutions uh, low jitter boxes uh, produced in December. Okay. So it, it should be last release, I hope. Okay. So, so I I, tr I tried to do the measurement uh, once again. Uh, just another question. I I just asked uh, Javier Diaz about it uh, some time ago, but uh, uh, I observed and also other colleagues observed and presented at. Uh, EFTF uh, in Paris that uh, there is some fluctuation between the output mm -hmm. from the uh, low jitter system. There is uh, this scale in the range of uh, one nanosecond accuracy def defined, but it is few hundred uh, picoseconds just uh, swapping. If, if you put uh, so the histogram, there are two peaks. Uh, did okay. you observe several uh, behavior or it is something special? No, I, I have not heard about this behavior, but it's if you have observed it, then it would be really, really uh, appreciated if you report it uh, okay. either to I the... I observed it, uh, and uh, also it was observed by uh, my colleague in, from Sweden in, in Per Olaf. Uh, okay. So, okay, just we were independently too, and we were surprised that he observes the same. Uh, okay, just I, I will report it, uh, okay. Yeah, please report because then it means that we need to investigate. Uh, yes, this is what we what we what we have, but maybe uh, you observe. It's it's always nice that <laughs> you know if 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 the system is used by so many people, then yeah, you can observe different <laughs> behaviors in many different places, and then yeah. But please please report, and we will investigate. Okay. So Okay, thank you. Then the, I think the next question is by Joseph. Is the amplification problem valid for bidirectional ampl amplifiers? Uh, the bidirectional amplifiers, uh, it's, it's a tricky... It, I mean, we have not tested... Uh, I, I cannot fully answer <laughs> because we, have we don't have experience with bidirectional amplifiers. I think they they might introduce some static offset that you will need to compensate otherwise. Okay, okay, be be Because the compensation, compensation that we are doing is basically, uh, you measure the relation between the delay in one direction and the other direction, so it's proportional. Yeah, they introduce because there is a single path, so introduce uh, the delay for both. Yeah, so so, so if, the, if the delay is symmetric, on, on the bidirectional amplifier, it should yeah, not yeah. affect. But if it's very not symmetric... single, very single optical path, yes. So it's big, uh, behaving similarly like a fiber. So, so then it should be fine. Uh, but we have not verified it at CERN. I know that there are applications and people work with this, but I don't have enough data to <laughs> confirm. <laughs> In theory, it should work. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. Uh, there was one question about um, the reason uh, that ports 13 to 18 couldn't be made as accurate as the first 12, if that is FPGA related. Uh, it's, it's just the resources in FPGA. <laughs> it's oh, a bit okay. trivial. There, there, we don't have enough timing uh, resources. <laughs> Okay, did I miss a question? Does anybody else still have a question? Uh, I have another question. It is not in the chat. Uh, just uh, it concerns uh, the uh, the slide number thirty-five. I think thirty-five. Okay. Uh, which number? Thirty-five. Uh, thirty-five. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, tell us uh, this sort of local masters uh, layer of the hierarchy. And uh, these uh, switches have uh, two inputs. So uh, it is some uh, new feature, or it is just some, some uh, like hot swap, or it should be switched manually. I okay. So you mean the redundancy in the in the switches? Yeah. Uh, so so it's somehow incorporated. So it's some some new feature, or it is it just you have to switch manually. But what is what? Uh, a port is safe and what is not a port is not safe. Yes, yeah, so current currently there is no so okay, what we are using at, at CERN, okay, this is the architecture, right? So yeah. all everything is prepared for redundancy. However, we don't have seamers redundancy. Uh, so currently you would manually switch uh, the slave from from one to the other. You could also do with the BMCA, so do the automatic resolution. But this does not provide you with seamless. Uh, I, I did a PhD on seamless redundancy. So actually, I implemented a seamless redundancy between the active ports, so this one and the other. However, this has not made yet made it yet into the release. So it is possible. Uh, I have heard that there is a company that made it into a proprietary solution that is sold. Uh, however, it is not supported in the release of the White Rabbit open source switch. So currently, that would be basically manual. Okay. Yeah. And there are on our to-do list, which is very long. <laughs> we have to support the redundancy, but it has not seamless redundancy, but it has has not happened yet. And uh, may I have a quite different question. It concerns the Linux implementation in that open hard in that open version. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it is pretty old, and uh, for instance, the SSH, uh, uh, SSH uh, server uh, is uh, just currently not uh, in a, not secure in a public network. So, uh, it is how, how complicated, or it is it is simple for a user, or not simple just to change this uh, this software layer, or uh, what to do or is somebody doing the maintenance because as, as i know the last version is about three years old or maybe more this is a good question for adam who is an expert in software but i think the short question is that it is not easy <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, it, it, I mean, it is doubly you're right. The the last version of uh, software is about two years old. I just checked checked this uh, 2020, I think uh, June, and the uh, SSH server is a little bit older. Of course, it is possible to to uplift to a newer version. Uh, we are using a build root. Uh, I'm sure it is possible. Uh, however, due to the limited uh, manpower uh, we have um, releases not so often but if it is needed then uh, of course it's it is possible to uplift uh, the only the ssh or uplift entire uh, build root so basically yes it is possible but uh, there are no resources if you have such a resources so if you are able to sponsor such a uh, uplift uh, feel free to <laughs> to speak <laughs> okay but if, but if you need it please report i mean yeah, yeah and we will just make it into issues so make sure that next time we make a release it is it is uh, updated uh, yeah. okay Okay. And uh, maybe it's worth to mention that there is, I will uh, post on the chat, there, is, uh, there are those forums on OHR. And uh, I think this is also a very good place to, to ask questions if you have any. Yeah. 
and to exchange your ideas and uh, even the, the work that, that you're uh, doing. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mate, and also thank you, Adam, for putting that link in the chat. Um, this was a very interesting talk and um, uh, I'm glad we had time for questions. Uh, let's now move to the um, to the next speaker, who is uh, Joseph, who hosted the first session, Joseph Wojtek. His um, uh, presentation is called Wide Rabbit Over Coherent Network. And uh, Joseph has a very strong background in computer sciences and networks. He joined Cessnet in 2003 and is currently the leader of the Department of Optical Networks there. Uh, he has been participating in the GEON project since GEON 2, and we have appreciated him very much as a colleague <laughs> since then. And uh, he is active in the field of open light systems, precise time and ultra, ultra stable frequency transmissions together with QKD and generally optical spectrum sharing. Please go ahead, Joseph. Susanna, thank you very much for kind introduction. I hope you see my slides. Uh, yes. I definitely have But it's to... not in presentation mode yet. Not yet. Sorry. No, it's still in. We, we still see the single slides. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have to go there. Is it is it better now? Uh, no, at least I still see the same. Okay, once again. Okay. Yeah, no, now it's perfect. Okay, thank you. Now perfect. it's perfect. Thank I you. definitely have to give a credit to my colleagues. Uh, first line are uh, from uh, to the researchers. Um, majority of content is uh, provided by them, and also the operational guys. We are really nice on us and allow us to, let's say, do the verification and cooperate very closely. Here is a very brief outline. I would like to men mention the check infrastructure for time and frequency where we are using a white uh, rabbit uh, solution partially. What is also worth the mention is that um, if you are running like 3000 kilometers of uh, time and time or frequency transfer, you have typically have to share a fiber with data. Otherwise, you will have to get every year significant amount of money for dedicated fibers. That is still the first site. Really? In pension? No, probably not. No, no, no. I'm on the... Yeah. I... It is nice yeah. slide, but... <laughs> yeah, is, it, is it better? No. No, it's it really... It's my site. And now, is it better? No, just, just. Still first one? Yes, still, still first. first. Okay. I probably try to restart the sharing. Go back. The window is not active. So, still first one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Any changes? Yes, yes. Second. second. Yeah, I, it's it looks like that I have some problems with uh, share uh, with presentation mode. So I'm sorry, it would be in this limited mode. So here are the colleagues which I mentioned. Here is the outline, and I think I stop with uh, fiber sharing. Then uh, I would like to mention why the problem of doing uh, white rabbit. Uh, uh, transmission um, over coherent uh, optical networks. 
They I would like to show some results of simulations provided by my colleague Thomas. And uh, finally, well, the best uh, verification of this in live network. So uh, this is uh, the or Cessnet is operating the uh, infrastructure for time and frequency. It's an overlay infrastructure. Uh, so it means that uh, in majority, uh, it shares the fiber with uh, data traffic. In our network, we operate uh, roughly 6,000 kilometers of uh, fibers. Uh, and uh, on top of that, there is almost uh, 3,000 of kilometers of time transfer, from which the uh, roughly 1800,000 uh, is our white rabbit transmission. They use both uh, bi-directional channels. And uh, as you can see in uh, figure in these insets, that uh, blue lines with, uh, with arrows, there are even multiple white rabbit uh, transfers uh, into the single fiber. Typically, uh, they are use uh, these uh, setups to connect with uh, uh, National Meteorology Institute lab and to assure that uh, we are really getting the correct time and uh, to be able to uh, compare this. And the reasons to build uh, these infrastructures you can see on the left on the slide. It's obviously the uh, fiber-based comparison of uh, UTCs between UTC lab, some alternative to the uh, satellite uh, transfer. Also, it's a distribution of uh, precise time and radio frequency, which, for example, we are providing uh, through the bidirectional channel to the extreme light infrastructure and other universities to the Ostrava or South Bohemia. And uh, finally, we made to connect all publicly uh, run operators of cesium clock and hydrogen masers. So colleagues uh, are working toward to synthetic time scale, connecting these sources together. And uh, on the right, uh, what I forget to mention that uh, we are also using own developed time transfer adapters. And on the right, uh, you can see comparison of uh, performance of both methods in uh, terms of time interval error. And you can see that time interval error is over, over day, uh, slightly increasing, but it's definitely meeting the design target, which is already, we heard it below one nanosecond for a white rabbit. And, um, it's uh, roughly uh, twice less for time transfer adapters. So part of uh, uh, that uh, time and frequency infrastructure is also the coherent frequency transfer. Uh, you can, uh, you have chance to see it in the uh, presentation of my colleague Martin. Uh, these are some lines with, um, significant number of bidirectional amplifiers. And uh, our colleagues are uh, using it for <laughs> very weird things like uh, interconnection of um, calcium ion based clocks or the sensing of nuclear reactor uh, containment stability. But what's more interesting here that to have a flexibility, we decided not to deploy the traditional solution containing channel 46, uh, sorry, 44, but we deploy the, not the single channel OADM, but multi-channel or the bent uh, OADMs covering the, also the channel 46, but um, these OADM, OADMs are even multi-band to cover cover the uh, 1570 band and um, would be better I show it in next slide. So fortunately our network uh, is undergoing a big upgrade because these activities start in 2010, 2011, but uh, last year we uh, started a significant upgrade. So incorporate these 
dual band OADMs into all major lines. So you can see these dotted lines, these are major lines. Uh, and we share this transmission even with uh, 100G lambdas, for example, this red line from Brno to Ostrava. But uh, in majority, these lines are shared even with 400G lambdas which is not a problem for coherent optical frequency because it's uh, unmodulated carrier, even very narrower, we learn from Nicolas. But uh, in case of uh, white rabbit, as uh, Matsya mentioned, it's um, uh, 1.25 gigabit ethernet, it's on off king modulated. And this, this is a problem. And I would like to show why. Yeah, this, uh, mm, I, take this uh, screenshot from a very nice uh, YouTube video. And uh, I put into the presentation through links because it's very important, but we are here a little time limited. But the major problem is in uh, high uh, free or high power free nonlinearity, which unfortunately uh, cause that the strong uh, and these signals can behave as a strong. Uh, they modulated uh, refractive index uh, and cause a cell phase modulation. Uh, if you are looking into the terms in a screenshot, the uh, first uh, term uh, represents cell phase modulation, where strong signal uh, influence its own phase. But uh, the serious here, more serious here, is cross phase modulation. And in our situation, unfortunately, the white rabbit signal, uh, amplitude modulated on of king signal, cause the uh, modulation of phase of coherent signal, which uh, here uh, we can uh, we can take that it's a signal E1, and uh, uh, so. This looks a problem for the op uh, operators of coherent network, but let's um, let's have a look at what, what's next. We very carefully start with simulations, and I show some result of simulation. Uh, as I mentioned, it has been done by our colleague Thomas, who is uh, uh, taking part in uh, War Package Seven. He did it in uh, VPI Photonics. So, set the signals to the signal of uh, uh, coherent data, 100 gigabit data, uh, and the 1.25 gigabit on of keying signal, which represents white rabbit, set both powers to the zero, and did the very nice uh, uh, simulation from different offsets. You can hear 50 gigahertz, 100 gigahertz, and even more. Oh, on the, the slide, you see you see the um, setup. It looks like weird, but in the left upper corner, there is uh, there is setup for white rabbit source. It's uh, 1.25 gigabits uh, amplitude modulating, and below is 100 gigabit uh, dual polarization QPS signals. There are multiplex sent into the fiber, and they receive here. We can see the result uh, on the right. Uh, you see the you see the uh, spectrum. Uh, on the left is coherent signal, broader, and on the right is uh, white rabbit signal. But uh, you see what's tricky. Both signals for transmission system looks like they have a signal. Uh, they have a signal power because this power is integrated. Yeah. So uh, in the white rabbit signal or non-coherent, um, there is much uh, significant power spike, which has influence onto this behavior. And going back to the left, uh, you see that uh, distance between signals, uh, 50 gigahertz is tricky. Yeah, the, it caused degradation of OSNR. But um, once we are starting to increase, going to right, we start to increase spectral behavior, the situation becomes better and better, and uh, uh, roughly speaking, for distances about uh, or 100 gigahertz here, the situation is good. There is almost no deter uh, decrease in the in the uh, in the performance in terms of bit error ratio. So. Um, 
this is not um, really new for us. We in the past already done uh, testing. Uh, for example, if we have coherent 100 gigabit channel and we put um, into its proximity some nasty uh, face sensitive OTDR, it's a device which uh, sends a short, but um, as you can see on uh, X axis, very powerful. Uh, very powerful pulses. You see that powers are definitely over 100 milliwatts in the past. And uh, uh, we naturally verify for that for traditional G.652 fibers, it definitely tolerates uh, much more power compared to uh, G.655 fibers. Yeah, because these fibers have um, reduced. Uh, dispersion, reduced fiber uh, core diameter, and also they are much more susceptible to nonlinearities. And uh, so here we can go, we can go for verification of uh, behavior of white rabbit signals in the coherent network. We uh, choose the real line, which is roughly 300 kilometers long. It contains three inline amplifiers. And what's interesting on that line, it contains um, majority mixture of uh, G.655 fiber with some relatively short 652 uh, last miles. So uh, as you can see on the spectral plot, this is built in spectral analyzer in uh, Cisco NCS system. And uh, as uh, you can see these three spikes, so three left are white rabbit ones. And we put coherent uh, 100G, it's at the right from that four spikes, just 100 gigahertz apart. On originally, it was 350 gigahertz apart. And uh, what uh, we observed that the prefect bear uh, roughly uh, decreases one order. Uh, we originally think that, okay, we will reroute the traffic um, from this uh, channel, put uh, just, uh, mm, let's say, testing uh, traffic into the channel, but the uh, but their uh, system is pretty clever. So it didn't allow us to do this because with only 50 gigahertz grid, the decrease uh, will be really significant and probably uh, even link will be lost. Yeah. We also done, uh, other experiments putting the channel not 100 gigahertz apart, but 150 gigahertz apart, and the prefect bear is recovering. Uh, it's also recovering uh, with increasing the spectral distance from the non coherent channels. So I'll try to. Yeah, uh, what, uh, what we learned from the uh, previous presentation, and we are also observed this uh, in uh, regarding with open line systems, that uh, the spectral capability or uh, capability of doing uh, optical spectral analyzer uh, provided by the, let's say, normal systems are not enough. You can see here the black dots. Yeah, this gives you normal, uh, uh, OSA built-in feature in the transmission system. But if you need to see something more precise, you have to go definitely with better resolution. So these are some, this is one slides from our presentation at ECOC last year, when we deploy a relatively uh, fine grain spectral analyzer. It has uh, 300 megahertz uh, optical resolution to be able to see really every details on these channels. These are three times uh, free carriers, every carrier with 100 uh, gigahertz. So if you have a if you have a time, I definitely recommend this video regarding these, uh, let's say, fine optical resolution monitoring and uh, telemetry streaming. So I have to, sorry, go here. I have the uh, conclusions and lessons learned. But definitely parallel uh, operation of uh, wider bit over coherent backbone. It's possible, but definitely there is some trade-off between 
performance in terms of prefect bear and guard band. Obviously, if we can, and these are recommendation. If you can, if you can uh, apply huge and huge mean like let's say 200 gigahertz uh, guard band, you are fine. If you can't, so you still can you place your uh, coherent channels in proximity of white rabbit channels, but uh, definitely would be better to use uh, short reach channels where the decrease in uh, uh, decrease in performance wouldn't be a problem. So this is everything for my original presentation. And if we still have the time, I add three slides for EOIN asking about the uh, DWDM SFPs in the white rabbit devices. Definitely it's possible, but uh, it's uh, be done in past this, let's say search and check that uh, not are the, uh, all the DWDM SFPs the same. Definitely there is some drift uh, over the time. In this measurement, um, the resolution was limited by the uh, spectral analyzer. So uh, it shows that some DWDM SFPs are drifting like 20 picometers, but definitely there are some good. Their drift is less than eight picometers, and the and this was uh, this was limited by by our spectral analyzer that time we used. Definitely, there are better spectral analyzers. So, yeah, this is a place where still can be verified if there are some transceivers drifting less. And the drift also can be very nicely used to the fine tuning of the delay. Sorry. And this is that slide. We definitely do take the uh, vertical, uh, not the this, this kind of laser, which is incorporated in the transceiver. And this laser is possible uh, to tune not into the large increments like 50 gigahertz. It's possible to tune very in very fine steps. And uh, yeah, I hope that do you see my slide. And you can see that we uh, were able to tune the laser over pretty large bandwidth and to uh, achieve very fine tuning of uh, transport delay. So that's everything. I'm really looking forward to your slide and sorry, your questions and switching to the chat if I will have a chance. Thank you, Joseph. Do we have questions? I don't see anything in the chat yet. Um, do we have questions for Joseph? While we're waiting for more questions, uh, I would have um, one question. How often do you have to do that fine tuning? Well, uh, yeah, this this was the experiment to achieve uh, to achieve this. But we we have been able to do it. Um, typically, wait for response of SFP. And I think if uh, my colleague Martin is connected, he can confirm what the uh, what was typical one step taking time. But it was like in a, in a second. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, any other question? No, then uh, thank you. Um, maybe something else will come up um, during the next talk or uh, afterwards. Uh, let's move to the presentation of Adam um, that we've heard before, Adam Vujek. Um, Adam, we heard you before. Oh, yeah, now you're sharing. Okay. Um, his presentation is called um, White Rabbit Management and Monitoring. And uh, to um, introduce Adam, uh, he uh, was a former CERN employee and used to be a maintainer of the White Rabbit Switch software and also a key developer of uh, other White Rabbit components that are used at CERN. He integrated and implemented a number of protocols in the area of management, monitoring, and configuration for White Rabbit Switch 
in White Rabbit Node. And since uh, 2020, he has been working as an independent white rabbit and an embedded systems consultant. So let's look forward very much to this um, presentation uh, coming up on switches. Adam, the floor is yours. Okay, now, can you hear me? Thank yes, you, Susanna. Fine. Uh, can you see the, this first slide? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Adam Wujek and I'm now the independent white rabbit consultant. Uh, today I will present uh, about management and monitoring for, uh, for white rabbit. The agenda for today is a few words about myself at the beginning and then the uh, short, uh, I will go very quickly through the available white rabbit equipment. Uh, later I will talk about the supported protocols for monitoring and management in white rabbit. And then at the end, very few words about available uh, line commands. So at the beginning, uh, who am I? Uh, of course, in the context of white rabbit management and monitoring, as uh, Susanna mentioned, I was working at CERN for five years. Uh, during this time, was, I was a maintainer of uh, white rabbit suite software. So you can blame me for all the bad things that you can, uh, that you can see. Uh, there were over 900 commits during this time. I integrated uh, SNMP, LLDP, and the Kerberos and LDAP daemons. I implemented uh, White Rabbit Switch MIP for, uh, for SNMP. I was also a key developer for uh, White Rabbit PC uh, software, uh, software in Node, over 500 commits, uh, developed uh, SNMP agent and uh, LLDP daemon. I was also involved in the design and configuration uh, tool for the White Rabbit switch, supported the integration of uh, switch and nodes uh, at CERN. And I also implemented the White Rabbit uh, Dissector, which is in place in, in Wireshark Sniffer in uh, version in Ubuntu, I think from uh, 18.4. So if you, if you open the Wireshark, uh, you should be able to, to see all the internals of the uh, white rabbit uh, packets there. And uh, since I left CERN from 2019 and from 2020, I'm an independent uh, white rabbit and embedded system developer. And uh, since that time, I uh, developed uh, the bridge, the, the two MIPS uh, for switch, and I added the VLAN support for LDP. And now I'm working on the MIP for the PTP uh, standard. So uh, now I will talk uh, about, give a short overview over the, the equipment. Uh, they are people who run uh, an experiment. Uh, they want to send a signal over the, the wire or a coaxial cable. Uh, they send it on the, on the one way and then uh, they expect it to pop up after a specific time on the other side. And uh, they, in many cases, they don't really care what's, uh, what's inside it. They just want to send the uh, signal one way and to get it on, on the other. So they can use uh, a simple wire or they can uh, use a white rabbit uh, for that. So basically they uh, send the signal to a white rabbit, for example, node to digitize the signal. Then they send it over the entire uh, white rabbit network and then uh, it pop up uh, on the other side, on the other side of a network, and then they uh, send it, uh, then they regenerate it. So uh, what we have here is uh, in the middle, we can have a complex uh, white rabbit network, but uh, the white rabbit network, the simplest one consists of, uh, of a switch, then uh, two, uh, two nodes, and then uh, we can have uh, bigger and bigger and even bigger networks. And uh, at some point, uh, we will realize that it's actually challenging to manage, uh, to manage uh, big networks. Uh, let's talk first a little bit about the switch. It's basically what, what Maciej said. Uh, few things to mention that there are uh, 18 ports uh, of SFPs. It supports uh, one gigabit SFPs, uh, both uh, fiber and copper. However, uh, White Rabbit is only supported uh, by some, uh, by the subset of SFPs, uh, fiber SFPs. 
Uh, there is also one management port, uh, the White Rabbit and management ports, they are separated by, the, by default. It is possible to, uh, to change the behavior, so to have a flow between those networks. Uh, of course, the, the flow is, uh, is very limited and uh, we, don't, uh, we don't recommend that. Uh, here we have another White Rabbit network. Uh, this time with uh, monitoring station. Uh, so you can see that uh, the monitoring staff, uh, the, 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 the switches, they are connected to the, to the regular switch, this uh, black, uh, black box. And uh, to, uh, to monitor nodes, we need another link, uh, which, is correct, which is connected directly to, to White Rabbit Network. So as I said, there is no traffic flowing between the management and the, the White Rabbit Network. Of course, you can organize it in a different way. So connect the White Rabbit Network directly to the black switch. And then from that one, uh, you can go to the, uh, to the monitoring station. So we have uh, switches and then we also have, uh, have nodes. Um, so the node, a White Rabbit node is also called White Rabbit PTP core or in short WRPC. Uh, it is usually uh, a card with uh, one gigabit uh, port uh, with SFP cage. Uh, and this card is uh, plugged into a host computer or it can also work uh, in standalone mode. Uh, the management and the monitoring functionality of, uh, of the WRPC is uh, implemented in the soft CPU uh, inside the FPGA. So basically the CPU is written in uh, a VHDL or Verilog uh, and then the, the software is working on that. And um, unfortunately due to this approach, the, there, is, uh, there are uh, limitations on the resources and especially on, on the memory. We are not able to put as many uh, features as we would like to, uh, but we are trying as, as hard as possible. Uh, there are many cards uh, with different formats uh, uh, that, uh, that, that supports uh, White Rabbit. Uh, more on that uh, was in the Magix uh, presentation, uh, presentations before. Uh, Usually the communication uh, between the White Rabbit uh, uh, node can be done in two ways. So first way is actually to, to use uh, White Rabbit network. Uh, with this one, you can use, for example, SNMP and uh, a few other protocols. And the other way is to use the, um, the local bus that the, the card is used to communicate uh, with, the, with the host system. It can be PC Express, it can be VME and a uh, few other, uh, whatever is supported by the, by the card that you're using. Uh, it's uh, worth to mention that in the standalone mode, this interface is not available. So basically what you have is if you have only access to a White Rabbit, uh, White Rabbit network. So now I will go to the uh, overview of uh, supported uh, protocols for uh, monitoring and management. As uh, Maciej mentioned in his presentation before, uh, White Rabbit is based on well-established standards uh, like Ethernet, uh, VLANs, uh, PTP, and so on. So actually to avoid uh, reinventing the wheel once more, uh, we adapted already existing protocols uh, for White Rabbit ecosystems that they are uh, coming together with uh, Ethernet networks. So the first protocol uh, worth to mention is uh, actually SNMP. Uh, at the beginning, uh, we wanted to monitor the timing of a switch, but it evolved and now we have more than uh, 300 specific objects that can be uh, reported by a switch and uh, more than uh, 70 for, uh, for a node. Uh, to gather the information provided by those, uh, of course, we use a SNMP. Uh, and there are a few choices. For example, there is uh, Nagios, which is used in, uh, in our test lab and also uh, at GSI. Uh, the last experiment in China, they use uh, Zabbix, uh, the picture on the right, and then uh, Grafana is also used at CERN uh, for, uh, for the uh, working, for the production network. As a good example of uh, showing the, the monitoring in Grafana, uh, uh, this picture can be used, which, uh, which actually uh, shows the round trip time of a fiber link used at CERN. The link is about five kilometer, uh, kilometers long, so which is a uh, half of the white rabbit official specification. 
but even if the link is underground, uh, you can see on the left to the center part of, uh, of the graph, the fluctuation. And this fluctuation is between the day and the night. It was uh, hot summer uh, that time. So there was uh, quite a big difference in, in temperatures. And then at some point uh, at the end of uh, uh, August, you see that there was uh, the, 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 uh, the weather became not as nice. And there was some drop in the uh, round trip time. Uh, so basically, between the highest point and the lowest point, uh, there is one nanosecond of, of difference. And uh, this one is all during the summer. So you can expect what, what are the uh, numbers between the summer and, uh, and, uh, and winter. And uh, thanks to White Rabbit, we don't have to care about those fluctuations. All this, uh, those fluctu fluctuations, they are automatically corrected by, by, by White Rabbit. So for the switch, we designed our own uh, MIP. Uh, we, divided into, we divided it into two parts, the stat status part and the expert values. The expert values, they are raw values coming from different subsystems without the further interpretation. Uh, then we introduce the status values to make to make it easier uh, for monitoring switches. Uh, we wanted to move the, all the logic uh, what's going on on the switch from the monitoring stations to, to a switch because we are the implementers of the switch and we know uh, what uh, what values are wrong uh, for the switch and we wanted to uh, to, to to express it uh, somehow. So. Uh, for example, when a switch is running uh, low on memory, then it tries uh, an error in the status object. Uh, for example, WRS memory free low, and then this propagates to OS status, and then later uh, it propagates to main system. And by this one, uh, by this approach, we actually having a one uh, OID uh, that has to be tracked uh, per switch uh, to see if uh, something is wrong or not. Of course, it's it's. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's better to to follow uh, maybe not all but uh, most of the OIDs to uh, to have a history and uh, to see uh, or to track the, the point when the, uh, the the problem had uh, had occurred. And uh, it's worth to to mention that there is a document white rabbit switch failures and diagnostics. And in that one document we uh, described a little bit more in details. Uh, what uh, kind of problems a uh, user can uh, see and how to how to solve it. And uh, recently, uh, after the last uh, release, uh, I implemented a few MIBs uh, for the to give to provide information about IP addresses, VLANs, and uh, MAC uh, routing tables. And those uh, MIBs they, they can be used by standard tools. Uh, so if you use those switches, you can integrate them uh, much easier into your, uh, your uh, management and, uh, and monitoring. And uh, there is ongoing standardization of uh, MIB for, uh, for a PTP. And for sure, this one will be implemented uh, uh, at switch in the, in the future. Uh, thing to mention is that the SNMP as today cannot be used uh, uh, on a switch to, to change the configuration. So there are other means uh, described and described and mentioned later, uh, but uh, SNMP cannot be used for that. Uh, the document that I mentioned, failures and uh, diagnostics, uh, it is uh, published at every uh, release of, uh, of a firmware. It lists the various errors reported by a switch, analyze those problems, and propose actions to mitigate uh, those problems. Uh, there is a similar document for a, for a node for a WRPC. And as I mentioned, the, the intention for this document was to, to provide some kind of help even for the operators. So if you don't have expert uh, looking at the network at the moment, uh, with this document, uh, we believe that operators uh, uh, we'll be able to solve at least some some of the problems that then can uh, can arise. Uh, for the node, uh, due to the limited resources, we don't have uh, the status objects. Uh, we only give the uh, this uh, expert uh, statuses. So all the interpretation of those statuses has to be done on the monitoring uh, uh, on the monitoring sta station. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, even though the, the limited resources, we provide the port statistics, the information about the timing status and configuration. We provide the, SF, the SFP calibration database, the, the one mentioned by Maciek in his presentation. And also, if uh, you have a SFP that supports the monitoring, the node and also switch uh, can uh, report uh, the temperature of SFP and the uh, RX and TX, uh, TX power. Uh, as a, as NMP on, on a node uh, actually can be used to configure some, uh, some parameters, the SFP database, the init script, and also the, uh, even, even to, to execute the, the, shell, uh, the, the, the shell command. And uh, be aware that uh, on a node, we don't have a support for SNMP v3 on the switch we have, but on a node, we don't have it due to the, the limited resources. So you have to use different means to, to secure your uh, white rabbit network. Another, uh, another protocol is uh, LLDP. Uh, as you can see, uh, so actually, what, what is it for? Basically, it's to answer the question, what's the device on the other side of the link? Uh, I think this uh, comics is the best uh, description of this protocol. Uh, and it's supported by both uh, switch and, uh, and node. Uh, on the bottom, you see this uh, tree-like graph. Uh, and such a graph can be, uh, can be discovered. So this is actually a graph representing a, a small network in a, in a lab. And uh, such a, such a graph, graph can be uh, discovered using LLDP. Uh, the, such a graph can become very complex. And this one, this is an example of a network in, uh, in a G, GSI in Germany with a much bigger number of nodes. And uh, this, this can give a very, very nice overview of your white rabbit, white rabbit network. Of course, uh, the protocol is not specific to white rabbit, so you can use uh, the same protocol on uh, most of the management, uh, management switches. So having deployed a network in labs uh, uh, where networks are not static, uh, it can, can be problematic when you plug a device uh, to, to a switch that in a place that it shouldn't be. So to prevent this one, uh, there is a radius uh, protocol implemented uh, to, to limit uh, access of those uh, devices. When a new device is connected to a switch, then the switch contacts the radius uh, server and to verify if the device is allowed or not. And then the, uh, then the device is gained, gained access or is, uh, is restricted. Uh, so now I will uh, talk about the, the configuration. So uh, in, the, in the configuration file, we have uh, information about the management interfaces, about the timing configuration, about the log server address, log verbosity level, uh, VLANs, and, uh, and few more. Uh, the configuration file on the switch is applied at, uh, at the startup. So it's, uh, it has a kconfig format, used the same uh, by the, the Linux kernel. In short, it's in this, uh, this format. So we have a key and then we have equals and then value. And uh, here I can see a, a part of, a, of, a, uh, of an example uh, config. Uh, config is uh, local on a switch. It can be retrieved uh, from the network. Uh, so at the boot, you can ask uh, a switch to, to gather this uh, file from, for example, TFTP, and then it will be uh, sent to the, to the switch. The other uh, option is to actually to use a DHCP for that. Uh, so the, the location of the config uh, can, be, uh, can be retrieved from, uh, together with a DHCP response. So there is a DHCP request response and then uh, the, the config of the TFTP is, uh, is asked and then is, uh, is received. Uh, to actually to change the file, you can use any text editor, but also you can use the kconfig tools, which is my config, uh, make uh, menu config and end config and so on. Uh, as mentioned before, it's the same as for the, for the Linux kernel. It, you can use also the web interface, which is discouraged. Uh, and if you don't have to, don't, don't use it. Uh, there are num 
there is a custom tool at CERN, uh, for example, it's called the uh, Controls Configuration uh, Data Editor. Uh, so when you configure um, your uh, your switch in this uh, this tool, uh, then the JSON file is uh, generated, and then from the JSON file in the in the back uh, backend, uh, the there is a generator generator mentioned uh, below. Uh, the, the config file is, is generated. For uniform networks, uh, you can use custom scripts uh, based on, uh, you can use uh, custom scripts based on the SSH to, to distribute the configuration file. And as I know, uh, guys at uh, GSI uh, does that. Uh, it is also worth to mention the obvious thing that uh, some features uh, they required to, to be enabled to work properly. Um, so for the WRPC configuration, uh, we also use the, the text file with the same syntax as, uh, as the for a switch. And uh, uh, the node configuration file is applied during the build, not as, uh, as in the switch uh, during the startup. And for some features, they are, um, they are shell commands that can be used to configure in, in runtime. However, it is required to have uh, a startup script. So when you restart the WRPC, then all the configuration will be, will be gone. Uh, so this one can be defined in, uh, in two places. So it can be defined at the build time. So then it's embedded into the binary or it can be saved in a local flash. Uh, so then it's uh, configured from, uh, uh, from the shell or it can be uh, configured by, uh, by a SNMP. And please note to, to keep the foot, foot small uh, foot, footprint small, uh, many features are disabled by default. So we'll, you will probably need to recompile the software for WRPC to fulfill your, uh, your needs. So uh, there are a few more protocols uh, that I think they are worth to mention for a switch. Uh, it is partly mentioned, it was partly mentioned before, the, the support for VLANs. The syslog, which is of course a very important feature, uh, and the uh, the methods to manage the access uh, for the for the switches, which is uh, Kerberos and LDAP, and those two things uh, can be used for authorization and auto, auto authentication. So you can use your uh, your account that you have at your uh, organization to, to actually uh, to to log in to 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 a switch. Uh, for WRPC, uh, we also support uh, VLANs. Uh, we support the syslog. Uh, it can uh, generate limited number of messages, but uh, they include uh, information about the boot up, uh, the, the link, uh, when it was down and up. Of course, the, the, the moment of a link down cannot be reported, but when the link is restored, then uh, the, the occurrence uh, of such an event can be. Uh, and sync lost and sync when the sync is recovered. Uh, also, the temperature uh, when it's over the specified threshold, then it can be uh, can be reported. To assign the IP addresses, the the node uses uh, boot p, not the DHCP as uh, like a switch because uh, boot p is much simpler and much smaller. Uh, there is also net console, uh, which can be used as a regular console to access the uh, WRPC from the White Rabbit, but uh, I will talk about that uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, so now very last item, uh, which is uh, the command line tools. Uh, they are very specific to the White Rabbit uh, equipment, so not to bother you too much, I will go through them uh, very, very fast. So. There is a WRMON, which is, uh, in my opinion, the most important. Uh, it, uh, it is, uh, it is the, the, the tool that uh, you basically open when you don't know what's, uh, what is going on. Uh, to open it, you can use the uh, USB cable the, in the serial console, or you can use the, the SSH to log in to, to, the, to the switch. It gives you information about the build version, about the link status, the PTP and white rabbit configuration, MAC of uh, of the of the peer. So actually, what's on the other side of a, of a link? Uh, something similar than LLDP can give you, 
and then timing mode and uh, time itself, uh, including the, the white rabbit timing. There's a, there's a similar tool uh, to this one for uh, WRPC, and that one is called simply a, a GUI. There are more tools available for, uh, for a switch. Uh, I just want to, to mention about two of them, about the, the first one, the WRS uh, Ashman dump uh, that can display the internal data structures of uh, WR specific processes. So this one can give you a lot of information what's going on inside the processes and uh, can be very useful during the debugging. And then the, the last one, WRS uh, dump uh, SH, this one can be used to gather the remotely view output from almost all of those uh, tools. Uh, and then when you have it locally, then you can forward it to uh, White Rabbit developers for uh, further in investigation, or you can even use the output, uh, output uh, yourself. Uh, more, more about those tools uh, is included into the White Rabbit user manual. And uh, last year, uh, I made a presentation during the White Rabbit workshop about uh, uh, the, the available tools. So I recommend to use that presentation as a, as a very good reference and starting point uh, about the available, available tools. Uh, for uh, WRPC, uh, there are more actually ways to access the, the console. So one is to use a, a virtual UART from the local bus, for example, PCI Express. Then you can use the serial console via uh, micro USB. And then you can use net console from, uh, from the network side uh, together with uh, SNMP uh, to execute uh, the remote uh, uh, remote uh, commands. Uh, be aware that there is one console instance, so that means if you type uh, something or execute on one command, on one console, uh, or actually by one way, uh, you will see it uh, through all of those. So for example, if you start uh, the GUI from net console, you will see it also on a virtual UART and, uh, and the USB. And the last thing to mention that there is no uh, uh, access control to to the WRPC, so be be aware about that. So uh, similar to the to the switch, there is a, the, there is a tool uh, WRPC dump, uh, which also interprets the data structures of nodes memory, and then there is a WRPC diags, uh, which displays more or less the same information as a GUI command, but this time through the through the local bus. And uh, also here, if you uh, if you have uh, interest in this one, I recommend you to, to go to the uh, manual of uh, uh, of the uh, PTP core and also the, the mentioned uh, presentation from uh, from White Rabbit workshop. Okay, thank you very much. And now I'm uh, waiting for to your questions. Thank you very much, Adam. I see there was a question about price, but it, it seems it was already uh, answered. And um, Vladimir, you had uh, questions earlier. Was, was that uh, all answered? Uh, that all answered? I think, uh, yeah, just I, I think that Adam already uh, uh, just answered the question. Or have, can you add, add something uh, new, uh, more about that? Uh, SSH and uh, the new uh, the replacement of some older software. So basically, uh, if you if you have a request to, to have a newer SSH, you, you can do that in a few ways. So you can ask uh, White Rabbit developers at CERN, or you can ask me directly to do that. And then, uh, based on, on your needs, for example, in case this one, the, the SSH, uh, I hope it's possible to uplift the SSH version quite easily using the, the, in the build route. Uh, if not, it might happen that it is required to uplift the entire build route, uh, which is a little bit uh, more complicated. I admit that uh, uplifts of a build route, they are not happening as often as uh, they should be. Uh, but simply this is because of the uh, limited manpower. Uh, if you are a developer or if you have uh, developers at your organization, uh, uh, there could be even, a, I know, the, the collaboration uh, for that. But 
I think it depends on your needs. Just uh, uh, contact us, uh, let's say offline, or even shout on uh, on the mentioned uh, forums on OHR, and then we will see what 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 can be done for that. But uh, I admit, but with SSH, uh, if you have it exposed somewhere uh, outside, it is very good to to uplift it. So bring it up. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I also do have a, a question. You mentioned CLI and you mentioned, uh, and you mentioned config scripts. Um, and uh, I was wondering for a, a large network like uh, the GSI example that you showed in mm -hmm. Germany, when you, they push out new configuration of the uh, switches, um, how do they automate this? Uh, maybe you mentioned it and I, I didn't catch it. Uh, as I know, I, I don't I don't know the details. I haven't seen, but uh, let's say the script. But as I oh. I'm aware, they have a script. They have a list of the switches, and they deploy exactly the same configuration file uh, into into those switches. So I don't think that uh, those switches they download the the configuration file from uh, from a network. For example, at CERN, uh, I'm, I'm sure that the configuration file is downloaded every single time uh, from, uh, from network, from a good server. Uh, okay, thank you. So, so at, at GSI, in principle, they have a set of scripts. They generate uh, the configuration for all the network from templates because there are the different switches have different roles. And they, they just SCP them on the switches and reboot the entire network. Yeah. And, as easy as that. Okay, thank you very much to both of you. Any other questions? If there are more, then uh, feel free to contact me directly or uh, write on uh, OHR on the forums. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, we're already out of time, so let me then um, yield back to Xavier. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you. Uh, I just want to thank everybody. I would like to thank uh, our presenters for the very interesting uh, presentations that we have seen. Thanks our uh, chairwoman and chairman, and also thanks to the audience. And uh, I, I will allow myself to send you an email when we will uh, publish our white paper related to time and frequency services uh, monitoring and, and management. So thank you all and uh, have a nice evening. Bye.